Hey there, Ancient Mahara here. With a question. Live streams, it's not smart to start a live stream with a question. I already know that, but we can see what happens. But I wonder if people, or if there are people out there, you might have codependency, you might know that, you might be thinking, maybe I don't. You've been in a relationship with somebody with BPD, or you're not sure if it's over, it's on and off, or you're recycling, or you want to get back. All these different iterations, right? So if you're not like 100% totally done, 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 and really deep into therapy and healing and moving forward, um, hey there, Chevy. Then the question is, do a lot of people with codependency, do a lot of people who've been in, re in these relationships with people with borderline personality, I wonder if people think that they can somehow do something better that will make the relationship better. So, you know, if anybody comes along and wants to share their experience, like, have you ever thought that you could make the relationship better? Or do you think in retrospect, well, not only the, oh, if only I would have said or done this, but like that maybe you could have changed something about yourself. That would have helped the person with BPD change. Or maybe there was some way you could still get them to hear you or maybe understand what you were talking about. Because a lot of people have trouble letting go of the, the few things I've mentioned and tons of other aspects of these relationships and the doubt. And, you know, when I'm working with clients, it, it all comes up. And people will be wondering for some time in their own processes about this, whether or not what, they're, what they did, you know, they could have done better, or should you have said this or that, or if you, you know. And the other thing, too, is that so many people these days are telling people with BPD that, or that you think have BPD, that you think they have it. Or that they do have it. Or maybe they should just, you know, kind of go to a little therapy and check out and see if that's what they have. Which is never recommended. Which, like, I can't say never, but like 99% of the time is not going to go well. And it certainly doesn't get people with BPD into therapy that they engage fully, that they want badly, and that they're going to really work in to change. So, you know, I've just I've seen things out there, you know, and, you know, there's this idea. A lot of people have this idea. A lot of people are talking about this idea that if a person with codependency could just have more self-respect, for example, if they could just have more self-respect, then maybe there's a way that you could sort of, I don't know, I don't use the word control, but you could... Change the dynamic, let's say, maybe. Because if you had more self-respect, if you had better boundaries, these are all ifs, right? But then maybe, like, you could make something different. And then the person with BPD would have to do something differently. And so this is like, it really comes down to, I've seen it referred to as sort of like the game, the relationship game. But I don't think relationships are games, right? So can you just like, the people with codependency, could you just improve your self-respect or have self-respect and that would help? Maybe if you changed your attitude, you know, your attitude, like maybe uh, just don't try to hold them accountable. You know what I mean? But how would that work? But some people think, well, maybe if I would have just been more patient, or if I could have just ignored more. That's why I asked the question, too, is this codependent denial? So I kind of think it is for a lot of people, but not everybody's the same. So can you go from codependence to independence in a relationship with somebody with BPD? I don't think you can, but I wonder what people think. And the other, the other key thing, when people uh, have codependency, which could be moderate, significant, or severe, right? Not everybody's the same. Is that people think, like, it's that denial aspect of, well, yeah, there must be some way to get through to this person. And so, some people have proposed that this be like a counter game kind of maneuver. You know, you, like you maneuver your way through the relationship somehow to oh you, you said you're guilty of that chevy wow um i think a lot of people are actually so 
to this question about people with codependency just can you just you know increase or you know just just like where's your self-respect and if you have self-respect could you do a better job would it change the relationship would it make the relationship better well the problem is you know people with codependency again depending on the you know but like but it's not just like slight which most people don't have it slightly um people don't really have self-esteem when they have codependency you know, because people with codependency are looking to others. That's that whole relational style that codependency is, right? For their value and validation. So other people, the borderline in this case, you know, um, makes the person with codependency feel either good. Well, this is the perception. They make you feel either good or bad. So codependence, in a different way, but similar, but different way than people with BPD are, quote, other defined, right? Externally defined. So how would, how would increasing your self-respect, for example, if you could, or self-esteem, I mean, or thinking that you should have more self-respect, well, you know, because you wouldn't be there if you had more self-esteem or more self-confidence or if you had a healthy and functional relationship to yourself or if you had um, self-respect. And people are going to have self-respect in different ways. But what am I really talking about here with people with codependency? Well, it's, it's that reason people need to get into therapy to heal and recover from the relationship with codependency. Because emotionally, what's still happening for you from core childhood woundedness. And so, you know, here's the thing too, right? People are always saying, well, people with BPD, they take everything personally. They're impossible, you know. Well... Do people with codependency take things personally? And, and have you ever maybe had the thought that, wow, like maybe if I just didn't take this personally. Okay, this person, I think they have BPD or they're not diagnosed, but yeah, they pretty much have BPD. So like maybe if I just didn't take things personally, I could make this relationship better and it would work. But people with codependency, <clears throat> as most people know, pay an inordinate amount of attention to other people's needs and not your own. So you might be in denial of their need, uh, your need actually, not their need, but your need for space and autonomy and self to be present and, and your own needs, right? So some people with codependency can be more needy than others or seem more needy, but not all people with codependency are the same. But, so so how would a codependent just act all of a sudden emotionally self-sufficient to somehow, you know, not th take things personally and make the relationship with the borderline better or somehow make it work? And then just another thing I'm going to throw out here about, are, are people with codependency self-centered? Like, like, could it be that you were too self-centered after all? And even though the borderline did this, that, and the other thing, you just think, well, man, like, if I could have just maybe not thought about myself so much, which is not what people with codependency are doing in these relationships. So are codependents self-centered? Well, no. They Codependents tend to act, now I'm going to put this in quotes, selflessly, unquote. So not really in an art altruistic way, but you're, you're negating and abandoning yourself, so you're not really thinking about yourself or your needs. Angie, for real? Are you kidding me? So, um, people with codependency have suffered a degree of loss of self. So, in stark contrast to people with narcissistic personality, right, disorder, their self-centeredness or even the sort of, the, there's a self-centeredness within BPD. It's not the same as NPD because BPD is not a form of NPD. But, so it, it's almost like narcissists are said to have too much self, which isn't really true either. But they're focused on what they need. But people with codependency aren't self-centered or narcissistic in the general usage of that term because it's the opposite. And so I don't know why sometimes out there people are saying it's the same and then there's this other reality, too, about codependency. Why, why would somebody maybe think, and lots of people do think this, I think, at different times, that if you could just fill in the blank, that you could make this relationship work after all. 
and sooner or later the borderline will catch on and get it or something and it'll get better. Well, this is the way people with codependency are trying to control and not self, but other so that you can feel emotionally safe or in control. And this is an emotional <laughs> level, right? Angie! Shh! Dog is silent until I start doing a live stream or something. Um, so control is one of the primary symptoms of codependency, and that can manifest very differently for many people with codependency. So it's control of self or others, but primarily it's seeking to be more in control of yourself and your emotions through other. So again, this is where there's an overlap between codependency and BP, but not exactly the same. Because people with BP are doing something not all so different, but yet way different in the reasons why and to the degrees and how they will go about doing that. And so often with people with codependency with this control that isn't always in your conscious awareness, it can get confused with power. And codependents can lack a sense of power in their lives. So it becomes, for codependents, this overcompensatory reality of trying to get your needs met, but still by the repetition compulsion externalizing out cycles. And people at BPD do something similar, but again, it's not exactly the same. And a lot of this goes on unconsciously for those who are uh, codependent and for those with BPD. So another thing, you know, when, when people with codependency, and there are lots of people out there, whether anybody else here tonight or not, but or might watch us back or find the channel eventually or, you know, whatever the case. There are lots of people out there right now with codependency in these relationships on and off and recycling and maybe starting to work in therapy and still thinking, but I, you know, can't stop thinking about them, really want them back. Which goes to the question I asked in a video recently, you know, who are you loving if you're still loving the person with BPD who you thought they were? Because you now know they're not who you thought they were and all this other stuff's happening. And so who are you really loving? So... I've seen, I saw something online, you know, and, and what was the question? The question was, um, oh, like, I guess, can the, the borderlines love or can you make a BPD relationship work or something like that? And I saw this thing pop up that said something like people with BPD are good and compassionate and they can have healthy relationships. And that they can have healthy relationships was in bold print, you know. And it takes work and lifelong challenges may remain, which doesn't have to be the case if somebody's healed and recovered, but whatever. And so, you know what? A therapist or a doctor could work with you and your partner to develop a treatment plan. Well, you know what? On what planet? I would say on what planet? But there's stuff like that out there that you can read that might give you false hope, right? Or strength and denial. But so how does somebody with codependency go about trying to fix this relationship with somebody with BPD? Like, find relief if you're facing relationships pro relationship problems with somebody with BPD. Well, seek out information. Get help. Just out of nowhere, practice healthy communication. Oh, yeah, because that one-sided, that's really going to help you. Ask open-ended questions. Oh, yeah, because people with BPD are so adept at saying what they mean or what they feel or knowing who they are. No. Um, and then only talk to your partner to have BPD when they're calm. And, you know, what's the problem with that one? So many people with BPD can be calm until you start talking to them about something. And all of a sudden, you're chaotic drama, you know, like what's going on? You don't know what just happened. But, oh, they can be calm one minute, triggered the next minute. And I just want to insert in here, because I keep getting these weird comments, always have, always will, from people with BPD that say, but I'm not like that. But, it, well, I'm not saying all people with BPD are in the same place or all people with BPD are alike. But I'm talking about untreated people with BPD that a lot of people with codependency are in relationships right now with, or have been, or are still trying to be. So, yeah, and the other thing you can do, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, but as a good codependent, what you can do, you just keep offering them support because you know how well they take that in, right? They don't, they don't take in your love. They don't take in your kindness. When they split to you, to, they devalue you. Um, 
<laughs> it's like, what did you do for me lately? And you might have been with this person for years, and all of a sudden it's going to be like, um, excuse me, did you do something for me? Because I don't remember that part. Like, what are you talking about? You're always doing this. And then it'll be whatever they're projecting. It's important to avoid labeling or blaming. Hmm. Yet untreated borderlines are scapegoating their partners and any relationship type scapegoating the person closest to them all the time with blame and projected out stuff. But mm, if you have codependency, you really, really have to just be like, I don't know, a saint. Be calm. Don't label. Don't blame. Don't seek accountability. I mean, how impossible does this sound, right? Because it is impossible. And then here's an interesting thing. How do a lot of people with BPD ruin relationships? Well, there are so many ways. I really won't go into them all. But like lying, um, avoiding responsibility. Uh, say what? Excuse me? I didn't. You just because everything has to be your fault. So scapegoating and blaming. Often cheating and monkey branching. But not everybody with BPD is the same. So how can you make, here's a good question. If you're in this space and you think you could just change something about yourself so that that you can make it work better with the person BPD in your life or who was or, you know, recycling or on off. How do you make somebody, literally, here's the question for you. How do you make someone with BPD feel loved? First of all, we can't make anybody anything really. But how can you foster a strong bond? And I'm trying to say this without laughing because it's not funny. But, of course, the only, quote, strong bond with a borderline is, and between a codependent and a borderline is a, quote, trauma bond. But we'll set that aside for a minute. How could you possibly or could you possibly foster a strong bond, in air quotes, uh, with a person with BPD? Well, it's important to know how to love someone with borderline personality disorder in a way that nurtures both of you. And may I underscore that to say, in a way that nurtures the borderline who's not going to nurture you back because nothing's reciprocal or mutual because they're lacking that self, right? It's rather inconvenient. But no matter what you give, they can't take it in. And no matter what you give and how much you try to nurture this to foster their, quote, bond, unquote, it is only going to be a trauma bond, you're going to be trying to nurture both of you. And you might not be consciously aware of that. But you can't nurture borderline. You can't nurture or soothe themselves. So here's the thing. If you do an internet search on this. So I'm just, you know, I'm paraphrasing. But like, how do we make the relationship work? Have you ever typed that in Google? Well, acknowledge the realness of BPD. How's that supposed to help anybody? Because when you get into it and you start to see what's going on, you're pretty much seeing what's real about BPD. You just might not be ready to accept it yet. Or you might be having some codependent denial still. Oh, and, and then, like, if you could just make room for yourself in the relationship. Well, good luck with that one. Because people with codependency are having massive issues of their own with no disrespect intended, right? That you need to take care of in, in therapy and healing. And I'm out here to work with people that resonate with me, of course, right? You can always check out ajmahari.ca. But the bottom line is, how are you going to make room for yourself with a person with BPD untreated? Who doesn't know who they are and everything's your fault and they need everything. But even when you give, they don't receive. And you, you try to make plans and they can't keep the plans. And everything's fine one minute, everything's upside down the next. Because they don't know how they feel, you know. And at the same time as you're doing this to create this like bond bond thing to to maybe make the relationship better with a person with BPD. Oh, first make room for yourself. Good luck because there isn't any room for you. That's one of the big problems. One of the really wounding and traumatizing realities in a relationship with somebody with BPD. Oh, and then people with codependency just stop rescuing. Yeah, just stop rescuing. I mean, really. And then encourage them to get high quality treatment. And how do you do that? Well, people tell them because, you know, you got this problem, this is happening, and then they're raging at you, or they've ghosted you, or you're getting silent treatment. But encourage high-quality treatment means that you're going to fall into the trap that so many do with codependency. That never helps. It really can't help. 
is if you encourage them to get treatment, then you're going to have to start talking about why, and that's not a really good thing. But where does this nonsense come from? It comes from these big treatment centers in the U.S. That, that, that they're promising you you can do all this right now. Well, if somebody with BPD has had years of really excellent therapy and they wanted it and they've engaged it, and then maybe some of that could work. But otherwise, no. And remember, they don't take in your love and they don't really love you because they don't see you because you are in their unconscious reality emotionally in a relationship kind of way, relational way. You are object other, bad mother or good mother or bad father or bad, or, you know, parent never had, whatever. You're not really you to them. They're too busy trying to figure out who the heck they are. And they're seeking identity through you at the same time, too. So what's really important not to say to somebody with BPD? Hmm. few things. Don't say nothing. Literally, this crap is out there online, okay? Don't say... What, what's something you should never say to a borderline? Nothing. Okay. Let's just leave that one as it is. Um... Don't suggest to them that they're overreacting, you know. Or, um, <laughs> but, like, what changed? What just happened because you were so happy a few minutes ago? Or you were so happy this morning? What, what, you know? Um, or maybe somebody could quip, like, um, you're all over the map. Like, are you bipolar or something? So... People have heard that BPD is impossible to recover from. It's not. But when you've been in a relationship or you're recycling or it's on and off or you don't know what to do with somebody that's untreated, undiagnosed and or untreated, and even if they've had massive treatment but they didn't go for the right reasons, they didn't engage the treatment, some people don't change in treatment, um, the, the bottom line is it takes years and years of treatment. And then they can have healthy relationships, maybe. But so many people today aren't with BPD aren't going or suspected BPD aren't going to get diagnosed, aren't going to seek treatment. Now here's you know, here's another good thing I came across. So so as if this would be your responsibility, right? But how can you calm somebody with BPD down? How can you calm them? Well, you know, I don't know. You you know Get them, well, you can join a support group, I guess. That's going to really help you to calm them down. <laughs> Just saying. Um, it's important not to neglect, you know, your your physical health. But again, the more you try to take care of you, it's not going to help the person with BP calm down or, or feel calm. Um, and if you learn to manage stress better, not going to help the person with BPD. If you listen more actively... As if you have a choice half the time, right? And be sympathetic. It's not going to help them calm down either. Focus on their emotions, not their words. Meanwhile, their words could be ripping you apart. But again, abandon yourself. I'm not saying do this. But, I'm just, but you know, th th this would be the suggestion. Abandon yourself and focus on the borderline's emotions. So, like, not their words, just their emotions. See where I'm going with this? It's really crazy making stuff and the other thing about this too is there are a lot of people out there who think like so turning it around so i kind of went in a different direction there are a lot of people out there that think that if they could just as a person with codependency or maybe they, people don't know they have codependency yet they think that they can just change something about themselves and like i said earlier that's going to make their relationship better with the person with bpd but nothing could be further from the truth because people with codependency need an entire healing and recovery process, yes, in therapy, because it goes back, like I've said before, childhood, you know, family of origin, etc. So you can't just pull out of the ether more self-esteem or how to validate yourself any more than a person with BPD can just pull out of the ether, um, like, why am I behaving like I am? Because... A lot of people with BPD don't know what they're doing or why they're doing what they're doing. 
And then, to some to some degree, a lot of people with codependency don't know what they're doing or why they're doing what they're doing. So this is another one of those streams where, you know, I don't know, people are coming and going. And But anyway, Chevy has a lot to say here. So you said you were guilty, and you said it's a really good question. Yeah, I thought it was a good question, too, but you never know how it's going to play out in a live stream, right? But people can think about it. So, And you said, I think you can. Ah, you think you can, you still think you can make the relationship better. Okay. Um, but it's like a plate you throw on the floor. Uh, you can glue it back together, but it's never going to be the same. I feel it's important to accept the change in the dynamics. Well, it's interesting because if you throw a plate on the floor enough, at some point you can't glue it back together. And a glued plate wouldn't be a plate that you could eat off. So how functional would that be in that example of a metaphor you gave? But then you said you feel it's important to accept the change in the dynamics. So in other words, every time the plate smashes to the floor and all those pieces get rearranged but somehow glued back together but doesn't really look like the plate, that you should, I don't know, is that what you mean? That you should change with those dynamics? Because actually you're going from, that's a good analogy in a sense, because the relationship is like a plate. And then when the plate drops and smashes on the floor, yeah, a lot of dynamics are changing, right? So you're supposed to accept all the changes in those dynamics and glue the plate back together. And the more you do that, what do you have? Well, you either by then are going to get ghosted by the relationship, that plate's going to walk right out the door, or... You're going to, you know, you're going to feel like you're losing your mind. You're going to be losing yourself. So really, can someone accept within a relationship with somebody with untreated BPD changes in dynamics like that? And how would that make anything better? And Chevy said, perhaps I um, still love my broken plate, but now instead of serving dinner on it, I'll use it in the yard for the fish tank. Gosh, good question here. Well, that's interesting. Um, and you said, we have such a hard time maintaining relationships. I feel it's been a challenge for us both, but also good work when we're actually being respectful and friends first. Well, you know, and I mean, it depends because not everybody was B with BPD is the same, but, you know, um, even healthy relationships take some work. They take tending and nurturing, but, but, in a healthy relationship, two people are doing that, not just one. And what else was I going to say on that? You said, um, uh, well, yeah, see, the, and the actual being respectful part, like both ways, that, that might n not be most of the time, hard to say. And you said, no way in hell could it go back to the way it was. We both shattered the trust and structure of the relationship. That's interesting because that you say it that way because usually when a relationship has trust and structure shattered, like what kind of a relationship can people be expecting to have when there's no trust? You know, when you've been betrayed, when you've been hurt, the person with BPD maybe feels like you did it to them, which is, you know, a misperception, of course. But the bottom line is they don't trust to start off with. Then people with codependency might have trusted that person. When trust is gone, what's left? Right? Like, like I, I would argue there's nothing healthy left there. And I don't think these relationships have much structure to them, really. Like, that's an interesting word to use. And they never go back to the way they were before the plate first hit the floor. And Chevy said, I'm open to the idea it's a total dead end. I just want to believe, and that's a dream of grandeur. Well, I think it's more, more than a dream of grandeur. It's a dream of denial. You know, it's wanting, it's needing something on the part of people with codependency that you didn't get in childhood that you need to get in therapy and find for yourself. Find out what that's all about so you can go from being a codependent to an independent person. And people with codependency need to go from that dysfunctional and healthy relationship to self, never mind the borderline, whoever else you're trying to relate to, in therapy to finding a healthy and functional relationship to self. So what I believe clearly, and what I see in people I work with and have for 31 years, if you want to 
get out of the relationship because you said it was a dream of grandeur, but it's really a dream of denial. And it's about wanting needs met for people with codependency, wanting and or needing to have your needs met in ways that you're not really conscious of. And if you don't go to therapy to do that for yourself, so simply what I'm trying to say is people with codependency need to get into healing recovery therapy for that to be to learn how to become an independent person. And this is first and foremost to change your relationship to and with yourself before you start trying to have another relationship with anybody else. And then when you when people get into those kind of healing and recovery processes, they're going to learn assertion skills and boundaries and a lot of things that are the red flags, etc. But things that are going to mean that what the reason why people with codependency jump into the almost insta relationship with the borderline won't you you got to go through all what what was that and what was that about what happened in childhood that created that that you weren't heard and seen and seen and heard enough in childhood validating you didn't ever learn how to validate yourself this really validating person came along and idealized you and you know so people with codependency need to take on this process to be able to go from being a codependent to an independent person and that's how you go forward in a healthier way. Firstly and foremostly with yourself. And second of all, you know, down the road in, in trying to look, you know, or date again. And, and because people often still want to have a relationship. But hopefully they want to work on themselves to have a healthier relationship. And, um... <laughs> Chevy said, uh, be the whipping boy and scapegoat. Ew, this is so good, AJ. Well, it's kind of what's required and it doesn't even help. So it's like, just surrender up your own personality and your own needs and your own wants and your own identity. And what's the problem, right? Well, of course, there's a problem with all of that. But even if you do all that, it's not going to help the person with BPD. So it doesn't help the relationship get better. And, um... Oh, you're very welcome, Chevy, and thank you for at least participating. <laughs> and you said both need to be active in their treatment, and that is so rare, well, just so rare. Well, yeah, and it's even less likely that a person with codependency and a person with BPD who've been in a relationship are going to be able to find their way back to each other, even if they both go off into their own separate treatment, because you kind of think about all that damage done. You know, and actually when people with codependency get into therapy, like when I'm working with clients, what, what they begin to discover through the process is that, you know, like the pain and the anger and the hurt and sometimes devastation and the trauma of it all. Well, when people really get into that deeper landscape of emotion and working on the healing, uh, talk about that broken trust you mentioned, Chevy. Well, then... That's not something that can be repaired. People with BPD need years and years and years to really heal and recover. So, you know, what I find a lot of clients realize, and it's a bit of a struggle for people in different ways, they start to really come to grips with the fact that there's no way they could ever go back to that person because too much damage was done. So no matter how, how much the codependent is getting healthy in their own therapy, whatever borderline might be doing in their own therapy, I mean, it's so much damage that these relationships are more often than not, well, like 99% of the time, not retrievable. And the more people go to therapy, the less they'll want to even think about, you know, oh, could we ever try again? And Tom says, I always hear you say, go no contact. What if the person with BPD lives across the country? and um, are in 16 hours of therapy a week, including GBT, is it okay to stay in touch? Well, I mean, I can't tell you what to do. But, um, and then you added, I want to go to therapy and focus on myself, but I want to keep this person in my life. Well, so you're trying to climb the mountain that I'm not going to say could never be climbed, but the mountain of like, well, if they're really working hard in therapy, and remember, DBT is not a recovery modality for BPD, so that's going to be a challenge. But 
I mean, it sounds like, I don't know your motivation, but it sounds like you want to see if when you get therapy and they get therapy, we can come back together again, which, you know, I mean, maybe some people are still believing that will work. But the thing is, with all the damage in between and all the lack of trust, etc., it's highly unlikely, but um, going no contact is usually the way that people with codependency heal best. And uh, then the other thing is, well, if, if the person is um, across the country, they're in 16 hours of therapy a week, including, oh, well, they're having some other kind of therapy then too. Well, you know, it, it depends how long they've been in that therapy, but I I find it interesting that you would... Eh, let me put it this way. The, the fact is if somebody with BPD really gets into, like, and that sounds like some serious treatment they're in if they're engaging it, and then if people with BPD really, it, it takes years, though. If they start to really change, grow, find self, you know, get that stable sense of identity and work all through that, they often don't want to look back. So, you know, it's a really risky proposition. And that's why I'm usually advising people against it. But that does, you know, but people are going to make their own choices. You know, so, um, and maybe you'll find out, Tom, that when you go into your own therapy, you may end up not having the same desire that you do right now. You know, hard to say. It's not something I would ever advocate for people to do. But then again, to be real, I don't like the word fair, but to keep it balanced, there are people with BP that will get through the process. Now, do they usually turn back to partner to the act? Not really, but you know, you know, I'm not going to say it's like a thousand percent impossible. It's just very, very rare. Um. Well, and I guess you know, you said you feel the same way, um, <laughs> Chevy, as Tom does. Well, eh. It's hard, it's hard though, you know, because it depends if you're in therapy yet or not. And if you get to the part about how lost you got, how you weren't seen and heard, how your needs didn't matter, the history of that in your life, and then the reality of all the damage done. So, I mean, when I healed and recovered from BPD, and I've been in a relationship with somebody for 10 years, and, okay, so it wasn't, you know, like, it it was okay for a time, and the more that I grew and healed, the less okay it was for me. The bottom line is, I knew, and the other person had quiet BPD, probably dependent personality, I don't really know what her thing was, but the bottom line was, like, when the better, the, the more that I recovered, like, you know, as I was getting towards healed and recovered, the more I knew that there'd been too much damage. And yeah, I'd done a lot of the damage, but they did damage too. But the point was, and we both had codependency, that that damage was something that, I mean, I owned, I, you know, I owned my part. We talked about it, etc. you know, after like I broke up with that person. Um, and, and maybe a couple of years later, we, we, you know, I still, you know, wanted to do the make amends and have her tell me how she felt, etc. But she wasn't in her own healing or recovery um, journey. And the thing is that sometimes respecting yourself first means there isn't any turning around later. But that's something people may realize in therapy. So, you know, um, 0990, I felt angry at her therapist when I heard that they suggested to her to be in a relationship. Like, great, have us amateurs deal with the object of their parent representation so they don't have to. Oh, man. I'm sorry to hear that because I don't understand why a therapist would say that. <clears throat> you know, because I think a key thing that I've seen in clients I work with with BPD is that they come, well, because, I mean, I do a little screening. I don't usually work with people who have no therapy at all with BPD anymore, but sometimes. It depends. But people that have had some therapy for BPD in the past, and when they're serious about getting help, what a lot of clients have said to me over the years with BPD is, you know, I'm not in a relationship right now because I know I can't be in a relationship right now because, and they'll tell all the reasons. So to me, that's, that's like somebody with BPD who's more aware of what truly lies before them and what they really have to work on just as a codependent really. And it's not for the same period of time, but people with codependency should stop dating stay out of relationships, do your healing and recovery work. 
And I think so should people with BPD. So, but I know that's not what everybody says out there, but I think that that's really the healthiest way for people to do it. Well, Chevy, I guess when you ask the question, why are boundaries so hard to understand? The answer probably lies in your family of origin and your childhood. Because to ask that question is an indication that you didn't, you know, you didn't get the kind of, you didn't get taught in childhood. And maybe you didn't, you know, so you didn't learn how to have healthy boundaries. And so that's why they're so hard to understand if you don't have a history in your childhood and family of origin with having been taught them. And that's the case for a lot of people with codependency. Because once you get into the healing recovery process, I mean, I I work with a lot of clients and I've been working with like thousands and thousands of people over 31 years. People actually start to understand, but it does take a little work to grasp boundaries, why they're important. Because people come out of their childhoods with codependency with like next to no boundaries. Um, hey there, James. I just cut off all contact at this point. I received a paper in the mail stating that her and I owed 8000 in back taxes and I paid to get that fixed and I and I uh, she had to do all she had to do was sign some papers and she and then I don't know the message disappeared I'm sorry to hear that though I mean that's horrible oh and then you said uh, okay papers and she now now she is making her current boyfriend to ask me to try and accommodate um, her so she can um, take her classes Mind you, she broke up with him a few days ago, and they got back together. Wow. And then you said, um, she won't sign the papers. Ah, uh, wow. Does this have any bearing on what's happening for your child? But, like, that she, oh, 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 um, stating that her, oh, her and you both owed 8000 back taxes, but, and you paid to get that fixed. And all she had, but she won't sign the papers. Yeah, well, I'm really sorry to hear you're going through that. But I think hopefully what you do know is that you can't offer her any more help with anything else. I mean, and I wouldn't usually say this, so this is just me as a person saying this. You might want to try, <laughs> hey, because all is fair and love and more at the end of the day. You might want to try the manipulation tactic of, if you sign these papers, then maybe I could help you with your whatever it is. But without any intention of wanting to help her, just to get the freaking signature. I think at this point in time, there's nothing wrong with trying that. I just can't tell you how many clients I'm working with now and how over time that whatever it is, like what James is mentioning here, but whatever it is, or when it's a divorce, or if it's about custody, or if people weren't married, or whatever it is, it has to be, quote, finished, because there's no closure. You know, just signing papers, or doing this, or some people are trying to mediate their way out of relationships with borderlines, which, again, they're not all the same, but pretty much that doesn't work well either. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is I hear so often about how the person with BPD, guess what, won't cooperate with anything. And then when you're all up in legal stuff, it's like the law is really ineffective in pressuring them or giving them any consequence for not signing pieces of paper that are so crucially important or for not showing up or for not doing this or for not doing the other thing. It's a horror show. I'm really sorry you're going through that, James. And Tom, I'm not even saying I would want to be in a romantic relationship again. I just like to stay in touch. I'm friends with all my other exes. I just tend to like to hold on to people. Oh, um, well, yeah, that's very codependent, Tom, because why, why do you like to hold on to people? Because you see that here's going to be the challenge for you when you get into your therapy, right? So when you get into therapy and you're really working on this, What's going to probably change for you somewhere in that process? Don't know how long it will take. It's going to start to realize all these people you're holding on to, exes or, you know, as friends, the, the healthier you get, the more toxic they're going to be. You know, so yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very codependent, to tell you the truth. 
And Chevy, we both sought treatment, not together, but simultaneously for several years. And to be honest, we were very open about the trauma we caused, and we know it's irreparable. So why is there still this communication about it as if, like, you know, you could ever have a relationship because it's ir irreparable, you said, that you both realize. Um... James, I've tried everything. I even had both our lawyers involved, and she still will not sign. Well, yeah, and this is a problem, right? Because, like, what does the law do when they won't sign something, right? Probably next to freaking nothing. And then you said, I will have to say that I have been trying to date again, and whenever there's something, so, sorry, someone that is interested in me, I clam up. I'm afraid and think people have motives now. Well, yeah, and, you know, James, I think really, like, you need her to sign the papers and you need to get this thing finished and then you might just need a little more time to kind of be in a calmer place without like some chaos and drama going on with this ex of yours or soon to be depending what the papers are she has to sign so i would think you need maybe a little more time to be able to trust yourself more because trusting yourself the measure to which we trust our, ourselves as individuals is what we can extend to another person. But after being so hurt by somebody in a relationship, you know, who has BPD, it could be really hard to build up that trust again. Definitely can be. And it's why we see there's a lot of people out there after, and, and may, I don't know if it's more men than women, it seems to be, but um, who don't ever want to have another relationship. So the hope is that people don't, yeah, I mean, you know, it's whatever people want, right? But it takes quite a while to, yeah, like it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are maybe not all cluster B, but there's a lot of cluster Bs out there. And then there's a lot of, depending what age group you're in, I mean, for younger people and the millennial to Gen Z group, it's like dating has become like a minefield, it, whether, some, whether it's with a cluster B or not. Uh, so I don't know. That's like sort of the, 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 men versus women, what's happening in the younger generations kind of things that are going on. Not that that can't be going on at any age, but it really does seem to be younger people today. Um, and um, Jeannie, well, that's so profound. I grew up with the worst families, worst family boundaries, and mine are screwed up to this day. And you said you're 33, diagnosed last month. Seems um, in life just uh, seemed off. Clinical diagnosis with BPD and um, is that, I'm not sure what the, or is that bipolar too? I'm not sure what that means. And you said, I'm committed to therapy and becoming a better me. I'm so happy to now know um, the what I didn't know. I have the desire to change and all the narratives, change all the narratives in my life, those um, of mine and others. Well, remember, you, you can't change other people's narratives, but you can change maybe how you um, relate to other people, right? From changing yourself. But um, that's great. I mean, anybody with BP that's motivated to go to treatment, healing and recovery is absolutely possible. And James said, you're right. I do need more time. PTSD is no joke. Right. Absolutely, it isn't. And um, Jeannie said, getting free and stable and secure and independent. Uh, yeah, I think you're saying bipolar too, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, and and... and however long it takes for people with BPD, it's important to just stay on that journey. And, um, well, changing behavior is important, but understanding why, what makes, where the behavior originates from, what motivates the behavior is also important um, in BP recovery. So in DBT therapy, you can learn coping skills and techniques to change behavior, but it's still symptom management. So really, people need to do that. That's always helpful. And then get into a psychodynamic process to understand more of the motivation, what's really driving the behavior, so that you're not just changing behavior, but you're changing yourself and knowing yourself better and 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 really building up. Like, that's the way to go toward BPD um, recovery to where, like, I know since I recovered, I don't, like, it's just not an issue in my life anymore. But, you know, I think, you know, this, this, I've seen some information out there, and I can't really say where, and I'd seen some of it before. And even people are offering, you know, their own, like, courses on this stuff. 
And and they're saying these things like, well, you know, if you if you just change your mindset, if you're codependent, person, you know, change your mindset, change your attitude, get some self esteem from somewhere, and you know, hey, what's the problem? You you know, you can make the relationship better, but that's still way codependent. Why? Because it would be a one way proposition. Because unless and until people with BPD do go to therapy, right? Like like Jeannie here is, and that's great. And then when when they get through what they need to get through in therapy to get healthier, then then there can be a coming together where there's a healthy relationship of, you know, reciprocity and mutuality. But not going to get that with somebody untreated or who isn't even diagnosed yet or isn't like Jeannie is becoming more self-aware. A lot of people with BPD or who maybe would fit the diagnosis but aren't diagnosed even, they don't have that self-awareness. And, and of course, people with BPD are all in different places, you know. So I just want to make that, I want to make sure I say that because it doesn't mean that they're in places yet to have a healthy, healthy relationship. But many people are working in therapy and many people aren't in relationships with BPD and many people aren't out there hurting other people anymore. And so, but like every time I say that, I also then have to just follow it up by saying, but there is a gigantic percentage of people with BPD that aren't getting it, aren't going to therapy. And I mean, these are the people that so many people all over the internet and lots of clients of mine have gotten into relationships with. So again, you know, not everybody's the same, but if, if the person with BPD that you're with is untreated, then you're going to be having this really commonly reported experience and trying to have the relationship that that a lot of people are talking about online. Well, and, and Jeannie, I really hope you're joking about that because it's not your brain at all. So you said that, though, that it works on its own. Because, no, it doesn't. And you can learn a lot more about that. Um... Well, you know, I had I had BPD once too, to whatever degree, and I was labeled, not assessed, and all that stuff. But the point is, very painful. People with BPD are a lot of pain, but then when people with BPD aren't going to therapy and aren't more aware, and, and even if they are more aware, still need that therapy, then that pain gets, you know, one way or another, passed over to a lot of other people. And people with codependency are also in pain. Maybe not as severe as the BPD, it's hard to measure. And Chevy, symbolic toxicity. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by that. That That's interesting. At times there's a good trade-off. Other times I think it comes from addiction versus needs or wants. It's not really addiction at all. It's trauma. It's the trauma bond. It's codependents have adverse experience or trauma in their childhoods. And for, for all people with codependency, it's not the same. For some people... It might have been something that really hurt you as a child and and or intermittent re reinforcement or emotionally unavailable parent or a codependent parent and or a codependent parent with a cluster B parent or two cluster B parents. But the bottom line is not all people with codependency have like a parent that hurt you in some malicious, obvious way. So some people with codependency, I know when, I, when I'm working with all the clients I've worked with and I'm working with now, uh, for some people, it's like we really have to dig into the emotional landscape to find, well, wh what hurt when, and what was it like, and what age did it happen at? Because it's not always about that everybody with codependency had a horrible mom and dad, you know, but, but often, for, for another percentage of people with codependency, you know, like, I've had clients, even older clients, you know, like my age or older, or in their 50s, say, well, you know... I never really thought about it before, but, and then, you know, we talk about it, they they look up their own information, etc., and they go, but now I, I can see clearly that my mother was a borderline, or something, Where, whereas maybe people have grown up, not, and, and this isn't the case for everybody with codependency, but when you say symbolic toxicity, Chevy, I don't know what's symbolic about, toxicity is toxic, for real, it's not symbolism, of something it's actually something that's happening and then when you say some sometimes there's a good trade-off like that i don't mean this in any accusatory way or, or personally at all to you but to say good trade-off is like what does that mean 
Because that's, that's codependency. Because when you heal and recover from that, when you get into a healthy space, when you get too interdependent and adulting to be interdependent, so that emotional aspect of adulting, even for people with codependency, like, I'm in a healthy relationship. I've had other healthy relationships be prior, as well as a couple of clunkers, right? They weren't healthy. But the thing is, like, I couldn't imagine using the word trade-off in my relationship. Because my partner is independent and I'm independent. We come together in an interdependent relationship. That is the healthiest model of a relationship. And so there's no trade-off. Like, th 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 that just implies, well, I'll take this little bit of shit from you right now. And you can have this golden, like, half the golden nugget from me. And then, oh... Maybe you, 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 you're you going to what? Hand me back a quarter of an inch of the golden nugget and I'm going to get a little less shit? Like, what, what What do you mean by symbolic toxicity? Because there's nothing symbolic about it. It just is straight up toxicity. And trauma bonds, let me stress again, Chevy, if you haven't watched some of my videos recently, if you haven't listened to the podcast, which is up here on the channel too, so you don't even have to go find the podcast, which isn't hard to find. Listen to what I said about BPD and codependency and trauma bonds are not about addiction. So they are, they can feel like an addiction, but with a couple of moving pieces of difference, it's not, the intermittent reinforcement, yes, it can mess with your chemical soup, etc. But that doesn't last as long as people think if they go no contact. And that's why no contact is pretty important. And so it's not about addiction. It's about the trauma bond. It goes back to family of origin and childhood woundedness. I don't want to have to keep repeating it, but maybe I have to keep repeating it until people actually get into therapy and codependency to figure this stuff out. Because, you know, I see it in client after client after cl thousands and thousands of clients. I don't know how many people I've worked with in 31 years. I couldn't count them all. But the patterns, there's only so many patterns in humanity. So there's only so many patterns in BPD. And there are different ones. And there's only so many patterns of codependency. And they're not the same for everybody with codependency. So, anyway, I'm just a little passionate. I'm not angry or anything. Um, sometimes I get louder and I can't tell till later if I got, like, loud on the thing. Because I don't have anything that shows me any... I should do something about that. Volume levels! Because I'm just... I was passionate there. Um, symbolic toxicity, if only, right? Because that wouldn't hurt half as much as the real thing, which is everywhere in these relationships, unfortunately. Because the toxicity doesn't just come from the person with BPD. It also comes from the person with codependency. Because the trauma bond becomes a dynamic. But, but let me take a moment to say, when I'm talking about codependency, I'm not victim blaming or victim shaming. Just saying. Because there are those kooks out there, in there, like I did the last live stream about stuck in their dichotomy. Uh, everybody's stuck in a dichotomous aspect of, like even what Chevy said. Sometimes it could be a good trade-off. What's that worth? You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously. Um, Dylan, uh, hey there. BP and MPD folks will not take accountability. So unfortunately, we as codependents must. Um, is that like... A, it, that could be a negative core belief that might be what happens a lot but that doesn't mean because they don't take responsibility that you have to but yeah that's what happens with a lot of people with codependency that might be a core belief and you say but they do not no you said yeah, right okay you said but they do not quote get away with it unquote in the long run the immense pain and hell that they live in is evident yeah it is and then I'll just, uh, I don't want to keep referring to it, but I'll just say, now that both my parents are gone, what's been my experience about that is, and probably when they pass away, like they'll stay in that pain and that hell while they're alive, and then, but they have all kinds of means of not feeling that, especially if they have NPD versus BPD, and then when they pass away, they, they will be spiritually cleansed too. So they're not evil, they're not, they're not possessed. They're not, you know, what, what all these other channels say they are. So, um, and I think that's really important for people's healing. I mean, you don't have to say it the way I say it or think of it the way that I think of it. But again, 
people need to do the healing and recovery work that will free you from either BPD if you have it or the codependency and the relationship and the anger and or the hatred and all the pain of the relationship. And so there's no rule written anywhere that because people with BPD can't take responsibility or accountability and <clears throat> people with NPD don't, that codependents must. That's like a negative core belief from somewhere in, in childhood. And Chevy, congratulations on finding AJ Genie. I was diagnosed in 2009 with BPD and finding AJ unlocked my life. Hang on, um, where'd that go? Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that that's been helpful for you. And um, just now finding AJ this year has been, well, you said wow for you. Well, I'm, well, I'm glad that it's helpful for you. Um, and Jeannie, thank you. Um, that's a more responsible um, speaking. Thank you. It seems my brain is in more control of concealing the trauma. Um, it, just a second, I lost my place. Sorry. While my feelings shift rapidly moment by moment, i.e. wherever they go. Well, yeah, and, wh and what you might not be aware of yet is, is like, and, and, and what that, what the, wh yeah, what the, what's motivating and driving the trauma and where that comes from, you know, because obviously it comes from your childhood. So, and that's something that, that, like, DBT is a great therapy to start with, but that's why people with BPD do better in after. DBT is good, too. But DBT isn't a recovery modality, and so to really understand that and to really create the kind of change that is lasting and about recovery, like being recovered ED and done with it after, like, however long it takes, is to understand what's really happening and, and where that the behavior is motivated from and why in childhood and the trauma. So it's really peeling back layers of defense and understand and, and learning how to cope with that at the same time. And, um, and, and also what you're kind of referring there to when you, when you say it's kind of like happening and while well, your feelings are shifting rapidly moment to moment, it's like, sounds like you'd benefit from just starting to map your triggers, right? Because when people understand, you know, it, it's like, and DBT can help you with this. I don't know what kind of therapy you're going to, but any therapy that starts off by helping somebody with BPD to map triggers, understand triggers, understand rapid mood, feeling, you know, shifts, changes, because, because the first thing to learn how to do, which DBT is great for this part, is how to slow down the response and reaction to, you know, the triggered and the emotional dysregulation, how to slow that down so that you can start to learn more about it. Because there's a whole lot of things going on in there that, you know, the, and the trauma of a lot of people in childhood with BPD is why people like yourself, maybe right now, Jeannie, you're just, you're just not sure why all this is happening. Or like, you know, you might know what triggers you, uh, like, to one degree or another, but you might not at the same time. So this is this is all what people have to discover in um, therapy and healing and recovery and BPD. And James, I would say I was addicted to the highs in our relationship because when it was good, it was really good, but when it was bad, it was horrid. Yeah, but that speaks to the trauma reality of what underpinned that in your childhood plus the intermittent reinforcement, and yes, there is there there you're going to have different chemicals in and, and neurotransmitters released in your system with that kind of up and down and intermittent reinforcement, but it truly is trauma based, not addiction based. But that but there is that element of you know waiting through all the hard times and just abject abuse to get that sort of high again of, ah, this is great, you know, but, but it, so there's that component in there from the, you know, the, the neuro the, the transmitters and the chemicals and, and the hormones in our systems, but that is not really this like, quote, addictive reality at the core of the trauma bond, which is still trauma. And then that, that sort of, I don't know what to call it. I just like that, chemical soup inside the human being that doesn't take as long to actually not be affecting people in that quote sort of way that there is that aspect of addiction but that's not the key core central reason 
because it's intermittent reinforcement and it's still trauma that's driving that. But yeah, there are release of certain hormones, chemicals, neurotransmitters that will keep that cycle going, but people can't know anything different until you get out of all of those responses, which often for a lot of people with codependency, they were learned and and you had that intermittent, a lot of people with codependency have intermittent reinforcement in childhood, so they've already got, you know, the brain has already been reacting and and it's sort of that chemical soup effect. But it's not really this hardcore addiction that people are trying to label it as. And um, I'm going to have a lot more coming on that on a course, in a course soon. Jeannie, um, I laugh, cry, it's weird. And as a body reaction that started three months ago, the way I feel emotions is like I can feel the weight of the world. Yeah, well, because it sounds like your emotions are still undifferentiated. And so when you're feeling emotion, you, you, I don't know, but it's, it, from what you're saying, I would gather that you're just feeling like this humongous amount of it. And, and what you'll learn in therapy is how to, for lack of a better way to put it, dissect, but differentiate the, when I feel this, this is this emotion. When I feel this, this is that emotion. And then it starts to become more manageable than that total big overwhelm tsunami of emotion that it feels like the weight of the world because it's just this great big, you know, you know the power of actual water out there, right? Like, like we've seen a lot of disasters recently. When water is like the wave crashes over and it's like, you know, a mudslide, whatever, and it just moves cars and rips houses and trees out of the ground and all that stuff. Well, kind of that's a metaphor for what happens inside people of BPD when they can't tell one emotion from the other and they're not sure the genesis of the emotion the reliving and re-experiencing of the emotion often in the here and now that doesn't have to do with the here and now but has all to do with the original trauma in childhood and it's like so it comes on you inside like a tsunami of emotion and it feels like the way the world because it's like what like because there's no differentiation there. There's no protection. There's there's often no understanding of like all of that feeling. Oh, Dylan, thank you so much for that kind of super chat. Very kind of you. Thank you. I super appreciate your super chat. And you said, hey, AJ, good evening. Um, where are my manners? Hope you're well. Oh, that's okay. It's People often get into saying something and then it's like, oh, by the way, hi, or whatever. But so... No worries. Um, I'm I'm doing pretty well, you know. We kind of conquered this freaking medical condition weight flare up thing, which is, you know, I think we're starting to get there, but it's like annoying the crap out of me. So other than that, though, and with with you know, and I I don't know if I should say this publicly, but let me say it in a gentle way. So I thought I needed to go to therapy because my mother passed away, and it's like no, not really. So I had two sessions, and I would just say the person, I, you know, I don't think they follow me over here. It'd be best if they didn't anyways. But they, um, they don't know yet that they're fired, but they will know soon enough. I mean, honest to God, honest to Pete, man, you know? So I'm doing just, I'm doing really well in a lot of ways, right? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. You know, everything's, I can't complain. So, um, yeah. Two, two of the most ridiculous sessions I ever had in my life. And I don't know why I went, you know, because after the first one, I was like, no, nah, I don't think this is, uh, you know. After the second one, I was like, absolutely, uh-uh. Because you know what should never happen in therapy? The therapist shouldn't be trying to interrupt you to editorialize what you just said. Oh, shit, did that bug me. And, and then the other thing was, I'm talking about one thing. And they want to go on and editorialize about something else that I'm not even. And then after I was like, I got let, well, you know, my responsibility, right? But I was feeling something based on what they said. And I'm like, I wasn't even talking about that. Like, what the, you know? And then th this person had a sticking point of something, this therapist. And I'm like, I don't care what your sticking point is. It's kind of your problem, not mine. I'm, and I'm like, I knew. I, I, I didn't even want to do the second session, so anyway. But but I say that only to say, I'm doing fine, don't need that, you know, getting through it fine. But if you do need therapy, 
and you have this experience, then then just, you know, fire their butts and go on to the next one. I don't need to go on to another one, but like, holy crap. What a waste of space. I don't know. And I, I'm not somebody who likes effusive, ridiculous, over-the-top empathy. Or like, I say something and they go, because like I've been living with it my whole life and I've healed. Whatever, it is what it is. Well, my parents, they didn't love me. And then they go, oh, that's so sad. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, what are we doing? Because, you know, I already know it was sad. I already grieved it. Anyway, just saying, just saying. But anyways, I hope you're doing well too, Dylan. And that was my answer to you right there. All of that. How's that? Chevy, symbiotic. Um, two asterisks, toxicity. Sorry for the typos. Symbiotic. Okay, not symbolic. I gotcha. Um, no, I totally agree with you. No, well, no wonder I went off on a passionate thing, right? Because I'm like, what do you mean symbolic? You didn't mean that. Okay. Um, yes, it very much is symbiotic toxicity, although the symbiosis of it all isn't really as like, and one, one is like, there's interface there, but it's not like a true symbiosis of uh, because one is, you know, personal BPD does thing A, codependent does thing B. It's not like that, uh, glued together, so to speak. And you said um, that you totally agree with what I said. Well, that's cool. Um, it, and you said it's all garbage. <laughs> Thank you. I'm totally banging my head on the wall. Well, you know, you just, if you're not in therapy yet, you know, for codependency and, and recovery from the relationship, you know, it'd be a good idea. And um, Chevy, I love your response and passion. It's from your heart. Well, yeah, and it's just a lot of experience working with a lot of people, right? And talent, taking emotional and behavioral responsibility for ourselves is never an unfortunate endeavor. Uh, no, that's true. It's part of being an emotional adult. Yeah, it's it's that it's that adulting process emotionally, absolutely, and become and and creating that healthy and functional relationship to and with self that people with codependency don't have till they do that healing work in therapy. And then you said being healed enough to do this is a great gift indeed. Well, yes, and people work hard for that. And I will take it that you're working hard on that as well. Um, Kita, I'm never going to get the apology I deserve. How do I get accept? How do I accept that and get over it? Well, you know, I don't know where you're at, but you might need to um, get into your own therapy and heal and recovery and look at your family board and etc. That's the really in depth way to do it. The the deeper way to understand, but. Um, and, and when you say it like that, right, I'm never going to get the apology I deserve. Yeah, I hear you. But is it really all about the X with BPD or the cluster B's apology that, yes, you, you would deserve an apology, but they have to first figure out or understand what they did? Or do you think that that might have, like, a double layer to it that maybe there's something in childhood still, too? Like, you know, I don't know because I don't know you. And you said, by the way, sorry for just popping in with a question. Um, I hope you're enjoying your day. Yeah, well, it's 12, 19 a.m., so I'm enjoying that, I guess you could say. Um, Jeannie, in California, I have Kaiser. I start there managing um, complexities, trauma, DBD, yeah, blah, 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 DBT program, end of August. I'm eager and have been trying to responsibly get started by reading about it and finding, um, well, that's good, and finding um, a community such as yours. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm now, the, uh, sorry, I, wait a minute. I'm now, this will be, oh, you know, this will be a marathon, not a hundred meter dash. Yes, definitely, but a worthwhile one. And one that, you know, you will see a lot of return from and, you know, as you're working and you're healing, recovering, you're finding yourself more, et cetera, et cetera. It's well worth the journey for sure. And um, DBT is a great place to start. See how that goes and then see where you end up because I wish they would come out and clarify it's not a recovery modality, but, you know, they don't. So 
Uh, but it's, it doesn't mean it's not really a great place to start. And you can learn a lot of coping skills for sure. Um, Talon, on August 17th, I will be um, three months no contact. Oh, congratulations. I feel great. Um, and uh, then you said, folks, give yourself this great gift. Well, yeah. And I mean, but I think you can remember, Talon, it probably took you your amount of time to get there. And so everybody else is in their own boat, so to speak, with that. But yeah. And Chevy, addiction for me feels like a big void inside of me. And I found pursuing passions in life soothe that void. Something about my gluing the plate is soothing, but you're right, trauma-based. Well, yeah, and so it's not really like... you. So what you're describing is what feels like addiction for you is actually still unhealed trauma. That's creating that void inside of you. And, and um, so you're using external things... Uh, whether it's a passion or being in a borderline relationship, you're using ex you're externalizing out still, trying to get that soothing to do something about that void inside that you need to learn how to take care of for yourself in your own healing recovery. And Kita, absolutely, there is a layer from my childhood. My mother treated me the same way, and there was never a genuine apology, excuses, deflection, or silence. Yeah, so often people benefit. You know, when they've been with somebody with BPD or NPD in adulthood or a significant other relationship, then they benefit from getting into therapy to do this recovery work from the relationship and the family of origin and childhood. Because, like I've said before, I don't think it's an oversimplification to say that almost without exception, right? So not 100%, but close. People have... Woundedness still from childhood, core childhood woundedness, that is the whole reason, not in your conscious awareness though, how you end up with cluster B in the first place. So to kind of like really work at healing and recovering from that is to go back through the childhood stuff, and the family of origin, really do that healing and recovery work because that's how people truly change the codependent, dysfunctional, unhealthy relationship with, with and to self to a healthy and functional relationship with and to self, which is really key. And everybody deserves that before you start to think about who am I going to get in a relationship next and how am I going to avoid and, you know, first get into a healthy relationship with yourself. That's what codependence will benefit from the most. And James, I'm very glad I went through my own healing and recovery from my three-year BP relationship. CBT worked very well for me. It was a slow start, but I got to where I needed. Well, yeah, and I mean, everybody, depending who they work with, might get a different flavor of modalities and, and, and methods. But, I mean, and I use I use CBT, but not necessarily formally. But I think CBT is, is really, I mean, CBT is one of the cogs in the wheel of what Linehan created with DBT. I mean, CBT is very um, efficacious, but a lot of people don't like the formal structure of that modality so but yeah it's very helpful and and i tend to use it in an eclectic way more than a straight up you know everything cbt every because yeah i find most of the clients i've worked with over the years and working with now um sometimes there's aspects of it but and it doesn't seem to be like a one modality thing that a lot of people are so amenable to but then it can help people and you can be like helped in one modality and chevy said i'm scared to go um to codependency class i don't even know what codependency class is or would look like but what if i come out with 10 more sugar daddies i love being alone finally um well i don't i don't know what codependency class would look like like i wouldn't recommend anybody go to the codependence 12 steps of ridiculous dysfunction because there's no 13 step called I'm done now. Bye. Thank you. No. And then people with that 12 step group stuff, unless you are an alcoholic or a drug addict, I, I would say stay away from 12 step groups because you're just going to walk around with slogans in your head. You know, and that, that doesn't really help anybody heal anything. Sloganism, you know, might help an alcoholic to stop drinking, might help a person with a drug addiction to stop taking the drug. And that's really important. But for codependency, I don't know. So I don't know, Chevy, if you'd like to share what's codependency class exactly. 
So I, I should hold, you know, if, if I was going to do something on Zoom and people wanted to join me, I probably wouldn't call it a codependency class. I would call it codependency court. But, I mean, it wouldn't be legal, and it wouldn't be judgmental. But that just went through my head for some reason. I don't know what that means, but, you know. Oh, you're very welcome, kiddo. And Chevy, it's a journey, and you can recover. Yes, and the only thing you have to do to recover is start that journey and stick with it, all right? So, because I don't know, but what, but but if you could clarify, what is codependency class? Because I just haven't heard that, like those two words put together like that before. And you see, if we didn't live in the kind of world that we do, with what's going on, that's all I can say on this platform, sorry. Um, then the education system, <laughs> it makes me laugh to even say that. You know what I'm saying? The world's in bad shape. But this is why they don't teach codependency classes and other things in public school and high school, right? Because, eh, the more we get lost in all that stuff, the better for them, whoever they are. Um, Chevy, I've gone three years at a time. No contact, but, um, but we'll hear where honestly are. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so you've gone... Three years at a time of no contact, but I guess you're back in contact is, is what that means. And um, so, yeah, what's, Chevy, what's a codependency class? Um, Jeannie, judgmental. Oh, yes, that's funny. That That's very clever. I like that. I've never even thought of that. But, of course, you know, everything they say that is so, quote, mental illness about BPD, etc., is, you know, they have to call it what they have to call it, but it's trauma response, and it's, you know, um, it's not really, quote, mental, you know what I mean? But, like, that's funny. It is funny. <laughs> it's very clever of you. So I guess I'm never going to find out what a codependency class is, so I must have missed that one. But, you know, when I went to CODA, like, oh, 45 years ago or something, because I didn't know any better, and, of course... We know more about codependency today than, than anybody knew 45 years ago. And I only went twice, and I couldn't hack it anymore. Those people were crazy. They were so dysfunctional. Uh, and frankly, you know, like, you're supposed to... I didn't want to listen. Because, like, how was it going to help me listen to toxic dysfunctional? I, I really couldn't get that part. And I was afraid to go, because I, I told a few friends before I went, I'm like, I'm going to go to this codependence meeting... And then I'm going to come out with 15 people stuck to my forehead. So kind of like in the same vein of what you're saying. And the little like, what is that, a vomiting emoticon? Um, so, but, and, and of course I didn't walk out with 15 people stuck to my forehead. But I was taking the bus home and there were five or six others from the group on the bus. And never mind that what's, what happens in the group is supposed to stay in the group. Never is talking about it. And, you know, I'm not like, I've never been, nor do I give a crap. I'm not like uber popular in any group. I don't care. But for some reason, they were kind of congregating around me. And then, like, somebody started it. And then, and then I seemed to be the center of it at this one point in time. Of, Let's all change, exchange phone numbers. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I didn't. I didn't. But I remember they did. And then, you know, I went back one more time, and then they were all treating me like some kind of a, I don't know, because outsider, because I wouldn't exchange numbers with them. But, like, I didn't go there to get, like, to make codependent friends, right? But that's what happens when you go there. I mean, it didn't help. It was, yeah. And and the person, that the group I went to, like, the guy was nuts, because he'd do a double share for every time somebody else got a share. It was like, dude was boring. Like, Half of a share from that dude would have been enough to just about knock anybody out. But a double share? Obviously, nothing was very functional there. Um, Chevy, yes, I'm in therapy. She's pretty awesome. Reminds me of, um, oh, interesting. I think we vibe well. Yes, I've talked about self-partnering too. Yes, yeah, self-partnered, single, yet unavailable happily. Um, oh, okay. So I guess codependency class is therapy then, you know. But, um, yeah, self-partnering is really important. And, of course, that's been a little bit <laughs> explained in a couple of funny ways online. But I don't know, you know, sometimes people watch my, my live streams and sometimes they don't. But I have live streams on all this stuff. I mean, if it would be a, like, if people in therapy, maybe they don't need to listen to them anymore or watch them, whatever the case would be. 
But I did do one on um, codependency and self-partnering. So, you know, it's there somewhere. I don't know how anybody finds anything on this channel, frankly. Um, Chevy, okay, good. Because um, I'm not going to 12 Steps. Um, codependency, I'll definitely bring it out at my next session. Um, well, I mean, you're, you're doing well in therapy, and you said it's a good vibe and everything, so you're learning about self-partnering, and you're single and happily unavailable, so yeah, don't mess that up with the 12-step nonsense. Just keep doing what's working for you, which in therapy is the way to go, you know, because because the only people on YouTube that are screaming about codependence is the way to go are people that have other problems for which 12-step groups are really important. And so, but like codependency isn't, no. This is outdated. And and here's the other thing. I can just picture in my mind whether people could go there physically yet or not or, you know, online. Go into a codependence anonymous meeting and you try to have your, you know, you say your spiel about being with a borderline and, you know, what that, like, Codependence Anonymous is not set up for that stuff, you know, and then, and so people need to go to therapy because there's, there's multi-faceted, you know, multi, or I don't know how, but multi-layered reality to this, you know, process to this kind of recovery. I mean, you're not going to just get with a bunch of people in a room who might be there for all kinds of different reasons, but I don't think most people that are at a Codependence Anonymous meeting are there because they've been with a person with BPD. Like, who knows, but I doubt it. So, um, and, and the other thing about Codependence Anonymous that really, I think, makes it, you know, like, well, not just silly, but dangerous to people's health, mental health, and, and you know, finding that healthy change and recovery you need is that they're the co-opted steps from Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I don't think it's going too far to say. To me, it's common sense. If you're not an alcoholic, what the heck is that going to, how is that going to help you? You know, I mean, and in therapy, people in their own ways will be doing what it says in, in step four about, you know, a fierce inventory of whatever. Well, that happens in therapy in a different way, different language. But I mean, when I, I did the live stream about, you know, are the 12 steps or why they're not good for codependence, uh, you know, BPD, when you, when you, the acts of BPD or whatever, I don't know. That's another thing up on my channel somewhere, but I don't know what it was called. But I actually was reading the 12 steps and then, and I had looked prior. I don't know what I looked at, but it said, I don't think I Googled, are they the same steps as AA? But um, they are. And so... You know, without mincing words, um, that's just straight up asinine is what that is. Because codependency isn't alcoholism, right? Like, and by the way, people that use, try to try to use examples of BPDs like alcoholism, nope, that's an apples and oranges false equivalency to start off with. So anyway, but I hope people realize that there isn't anything that a person with codependency can do better or different, or differently, that's going to make the relationship with somebody with BPD untreated, or, or it, you know, not amenable to treatment, not getting anywhere with it, as many people will, but not all do, um, there's nothing you could do to make it better. And so the answer still remains getting into your own therapy, healing recovery process, and also um, going no contact. Because... That helps with the intermittent reinforcement, helps your brain to calm down from, you know, oh, I'm going to take all this, like, you don't know this consciously, right? I'm going to take all this abuse right now until it gets good again, right? Like, and actually people's choices take their brain on a ride, and then that takes you on a ride, and it's like, it's like a vicious circle. So no contact is part of breaking that, intermittent reinforcement reaction of, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters in the body, etc., gives people a little bit of space and time to take the next step forward in therapy as well. And Chevy said, I think it's definitely trauma response due to survival myself. Yes. Um, along with my ex-boyfriend being undiagnosed, um, <laughs> I like the way you spelled schizo. I think that's what you said there, but... Um, 
you literally spelt it how it should be spelt, but like, of course, it's more complicated spelling than that. Anyway, um, unlike um, you said, my ex boyfriend being um, undiagnosed schizo and did the unthinkable. Perhaps it's a level of survivor syndrome and grief. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think I think codependency is so in a similar fashion, not exactly the same as BPD or NPD. They're all adaptations to survive. They all are. Codependency is, BPD is, NPD is. That doesn't mean they're all the same, though. And um, I'm not going to know how to say your name there. Sorry. You said, hey, AJ, I need help. My quiet BPD undiagnosed and untreated ex broke up with me for a month now. Second time. I'm sure she has quiet BPD because of how she internalized everything. Got blindsided. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that. But, but being as this is the second time she's broken up with you, uh, that kind of means there's a pattern developing there. And so, um, and I mean, I'm out here to help people one-on-one. -on -one. If people are interested, you can check that out at hmr.ca. And um, Chevy, uh, interesting, I had no idea you addressed self-parenting, part partnering parenting. Oh, yes, no, of course I did. What do you think? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I just say that with a laugh out loud attached to it, too. Um, yes, of course. I mean, I just, I know this stuff, people. I know stuff, people. So, I'm just, you know, I'm goofing around. But yes, I did. But like I said, how do you find stuff on this channel? I don't know. Um, because some videos I do, you know, like the, the newest uploads, not so much lately, but a few, they'll just get, like, not watched. Okay, fine. And then... There's older ones get more watched, but were they more watched? Well, no, I don't know, because there's, there's, I don't know, I'm approaching like 900 videos. So when I put this out there, it's not me going raw me. I'm like, seriously, how does anybody find anything on this channel that isn't the uploads thing? So you can check out the playlists, right? But I'm not much help because obviously the channel, I don't remember, but I, I did a live stream on self-partnering. I know that. And I probably mentioned it in a few videos. But see, I can't remember what it was called. So if I could remember what it was called, I could tell you. And then if you had any interest in watching it or listening to it, whichever way it was done, you could put the title in and find it, right? But I don't know. I think, I think if people are interested in finding any more of my videos than what's in the upload column or recent or... Yeah, check out playlists. But the other thing is, just put in like, self-partnering codependency put my name after it though and and then you'll find things like that so anything you wonder if i've talked about it just play around with search terms in the on youtube and if you stick my name after it that might be a way to find other videos you know like or older videos so i've done so many bloody videos in the last i don't know how many months that yeah so that's and and, and i think if i ever get time but i don't know where i'm going to find the time and some people might say, well, you're live streaming. You could have used this time. I hate it when people say that because it's really kind of like ridiculous because I'm using this time for this. But I want to reorganize my playlist. But then <laughs> I look at like over 900 or what is it, 840, 50 videos right now. And I'm like, I don't have time to do that. Right. So because that would help, too. So anyway, because um, yeah, I think sometimes people find the channel by. But like just a certain video out there it could be like three years old, two years old, a year old, 11 years old, nine years old. And then, you know, maybe they watch more, maybe they go away. Who knows? So, um, but that's why you would have no idea, I guess, in a way. I don't know how much you watch a channel, but also I, I do keep wondering how people find videos. Nobody ever answers that. So I take it that there is an answer <laughs> like, well, I did this and then I did that. And I found this, and then I found that. I don't know. And um, Chevy said, thank you for your validation always and keeping it real. You're very welcome. So, yeah. I mean, unless somebody else has anything else to say or ask, I don't know if I have much else to say. And I think the shorter I keep them, kind of the better, you know. But um, it, it, it just interesting that I can't really say why I started thinking about this or why it... I didn't just start thinking about it. But I can't really say why. But this idea that people, you know, with codependency could just pick something about themselves and it would make the relationship with the borderline better. No. Nah. Because you can't because people with codependency 
can't just fix whatever. There is no magical thing you could fix or or heal. But you know you need to do that for you. But you can't just take one component out of it and like change it. And even if you could, no, well, wouldn't change the relationship anyway, right? So yeah, it. But I think there's a lot of denial in codependency. So. You know, I would say to people, like I did a video and I mentioned this, but I think it was just a regular video. But, you know, don't be one of the codependents that gets left, you know, in the river denial. So you're standing knee deep in a river of denial, and but you're dying of thirst. And what might that mean? Well, when you know what's going on in the relationship and you have enough information and clearly you don't know, it feels impossible to get out of it or if they've ghosted or discarded you, it's impossible to let it go. It feels that way. But that's where you have to realize you're standing in the river denial and you're up to your knees in water, but you're dying of thirst. So, so that means like the way is all around you and it's a little more obvious than it might feel like it is and so people have to set that intent and then get into action and like that one action step would be therapy right and justin um that's the hard part for me realizing it's not my fault hmm well yeah i mean and, and i think a lot of people with codependency struggle with that uh, because people will say like when they're trying to work through a relationship or let it go or like, you know, when I work with clients, they'll say, well, but like, I don't know how to, I have clients come, you know, if they're still in the relationship, if they don't know if they would. So, you know, I'm not saying to people, you have to do this, this, and this, and this, just know. So if I resonate with anybody out there, people come to me wherever they're at with it, right? Some people are other relationship, they're fed up. Some people are like, still in the relationship and some people are still sure it's going to work out somehow and so whatever it doesn't matter but just to what you said justin a lot of people will say in in sessions and i've said all over this channel and probably others but like i can't go no contact because this is an example right i can't go no contact because that's not me i can't do abc because like i wouldn't be being me and that's like wow you know because if, if people with codependency don't even really know what being me, being being yourself, means, like in total, certainly in the emotional landscape. So, but people with codependency, for reasons that you'll find out when you go to therapy, family of origin and the childhood woundedness from, I mean, the left, the woundedness that still exists from childhood, is what's driving toxic guilt, and and or this idea that it's your fault, or toxic guilt and toxic shame. And then people with codependency say, well, like, I can't do this because, like, I'd feel horrible because that's not who I am. But that that is just, like, a denying, sort of, like, deflecting, sort of, like, it's an emotional statement, but it, it it's sort of a statement that's kind of lost in a way. Like, people don't realize what they're actually saying with that. And by the way, let, let me remind you, too, that if you say, I can't, <clears throat> you might really feel like you can't. But when you say, I can't, it, you're really saying, I won't. And if somebody says, well, I'm going to try not to contact my ex again. No, that's setting yourself up for failure because trying isn't doing. And that's why it's important to set the intent. And then you act on the intent. And that intent might be no contact. And you go no contact. And it feels impossible. And it might hurt. And it might be really hard to, to, to keep going through. Or that intent might be, I'm finally going to get into therapy for people that might not have yet. And then you take the action steps towards doing that. And then you just take it one step at a time. And Ace said, your videos come up in my suggested. Well, that's good because because that, that's going to bring up the new ones. But you see old ones in the suggested. you know. And he said, the first time I saw your channel was in reference to parentification. It was in the sidebar thing. Oh, okay. Well, I, and I'm sure people find my channel very much similarly to the way you did. Well, you know, one way or the other, one video or the other. But I guess my question is, once people have found it, like, I wonder how... Because there's been some people that have navigated through a lot of videos. Because they'll comment on a lot of videos. And then I can, I can just see that. But my question is more like, how do they... I mean, I don't know what comes up in Suggested because... 
when I'm on YouTube, like, I could be watching, I don't know, like, I watch a lot of philosophy. What else do I watch? I don't know, documentaries, just various sports, other topics. And my stupid videos will come up and recommend it because it's me. Like, I don't think they would come up and recommend it for anyone else. So I really can't tell what other people are seeing out there because it. I'm going to see my videos more because I'm me, if that makes any sense. That's what I think happens. I don't know. YouTube algorithm. It, it, you know, even for the techie people that can figure it out, every time you figure it out, they change it again. So, you know, that's the whole deal right there. But thanks for sharing that, Ace. And, um, Chevy, to be real with you, that's a good idea, because I'm pretty real with you guys. Um, the schizo, oh, sorry, killed his father. Uh, my hometown looks at him like a monster. Maybe he is. But I value him and feel like it's a scarlet letter of my hometown. Well, when you say schizo, do you mean schizophrenic or schizotypal? Because, you know, often people with schizophrenia, not that everybody with schizophrenia, but, you know, they have these hallucinations and they have this, you know, it's a psychotic break with reality and things can happen and um, can be very violent. So really sorry to hear that. Um, and, you know, I mean, um, I'm not going to put any value judgment to does that make somebody, quote, a monster, unquote. But um, it probably means a lot of people are afraid of him. And then again, if somebody's, you know, taking someone's life, it's like, do you want to be their neighbor necessarily? Do you want to be friends? Like, it's hard, right? It's really hard. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to put in any judgment or value judgment. So, by the way, that's uh, the therapist there who I'm firing her butt. That's what she did too. She, she dropped in the middle of the last session, a big value judgment. I'm like, no, you can shove that where the sun don't shine. Because, you know, these are the things that I would never do when I'm working with clients. It's like this one needs to like maybe go back and learn a few things. I, I would humbly say, I have no idea. I don't want to know. I don't want to know why she's the way she is. Um, I guess it's probably just safe to say we're not a fit. Um, and Justin, my codependency came from pleasing tyrant cluster B father in early teens. Well, yeah, I hear you on that. And, um, oh, you said stop reading my mind, AJ. Well, goodness, I didn't know I was. Um, and the other thing about that, Justin, is that when you know that, right? And so that's a big, you know, that's, that's trauma in your teens, and, um, and then, you know, if you, I don't know if you've been to therapy or not yet, or if you're in therapy, the important part of that to work out is not only obviously what you do know and you're aware of and what that was like, but also, you know, what happened in the family system around that, you know, because, because often it's family of origin. And, and, and when I say assigned roles, it doesn't always just mean scapegoat, golden child, but just it's like perception sometimes, along with maybe scapegoat or golden child or lost children. But um, but when something happens between a person and their father like that, it it shifts and the dynamics are all out of whack across the family system. So that's why it's important to look at family of origin work as well. And Chevy, to see this other man with BPD... Using the click words and dialogue, not yelling at me and listening to me, asking me about me feels soothing. It's a brick wall. Ouch. Um, to see this other man with BPD using the click words and dialogue, um, not yelling at me and listening to me uh, feels soothing. Ah, well, yeah, and that's sort of like a bit of a mirage, isn't it? Because it doesn't last doesn't have consistency or congruency to it. So it probably comes and goes. And then you said, it's a brick wall. Ouch. So yeah, it's like, if it, it you know, it, I use it like, did you really ever experience it? Or did you just get it intermittently, like maybe sort of seemingly, and it was more like a mirage, but you've described it as a brick wall, which is fair too. And, um, he said, broken record, gosh, I need a hobby. Well, that's interesting. I don't really know what you mean by that. So, um, hey, so yep, videos from three, five, seven years ago pop up occasionally. I haven't attempted to seek out on a specific video or topic on your channel, however, 
and can't really comment. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that feedback, too. That's helpful. And um, Chevy, oh, I'm not swimming in the river. I'm the unsinkable. Well, I was talking about, okay. I'm the unsinkable um, Mary. I'm not sure what that is. Floating the river for denial. Feeling a little, um, oh, okay, yes, I get. I think I get what you mean by that word. Yes, okay. So, I don't know if that's what you meant by, or no, somebody else said I was reading their mind. Um, and Chevy said, calling me out over here. Oh, I see, okay, well, um, if, if, you know, like, of course, know that I'm not doing that in any way that, you know. Because cause on this channel, I'm like, well, I shouldn't say, but, you know, I don't yell and scream at people and then expect them to say thank you, like happens somewhere else on YouTube. It's very amazing. It's very sad to watch that, actually. Anyway, um, Justin, I'm in therapy, but I need to reach out to you. Well, you know, that's your choice, Justin, and if you want to, like, I'd be happy to help in any way I can. So, you know, I mean, some people find really good bits and... Maybe some, and, and, you know, I work with a lot of people who have another therapist and, and, or they're working with somebody else and, and then they come to me and then just sometimes they work with me and that other person and sometimes it's a switch and, you know, but everybody makes their own choices. And so, yeah, if you ever want to, I, you know, you can find out how to do that at hmr.ca. So, um, and that's why I'm out here. So. And the other thing, too, is, you know, like, I really keep saying this, and I really keep having no time, uh, but I got to work on it, is this course I'm putting together, um, you know, which I'm not even sure what I should call it, because I'm working from, you know, it's going to have a lot to do with codependency, but I'm not sure what's going to end up looking like, so. But it, it will be coming in modules, so the idea is that I will have a module, and then another module, and then another module. And then as there's more modules, you know, a person could purchase two of the modules out of, like, if there ends up being six modules, you could purchase two at a time, or all six, or three, or these two, or that one, or, you know, because I, I think structuring things that way makes it really helpful for people to know. Like, right now, I mean, I, I should do this, and I've been thinking about this, because I'm probably going to slow down on YouTube for sure, and I'm not coming back on camera till we get the other thing under control because I think I jumped the shark in the last video with the camera angle. I'm like, holy shit, we're not doing that anymore. So it has nothing to do with trolls. So I think what I'm going to do is, you know, sometimes I come here and say a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a video. And then I go like, why don't you just go deeper with that in like three or four videos with some worksheets? And there's a little module. Right? And these things aren't going to cost an arm and a leg, right? So, and and then I was thinking tonight, I was like, should I do this in a live stream or should I just put it into a course? But, you know, so, um, yeah. So I decided to do the live stream, obviously, or I wouldn't be here. So, and the other thing is, like, doesn't matter. But my partner's off on a little, another little business trip. And so, yeah, I have time. Even though I would do it like if she was here, but like I'm just saying, it's an added incentive to, you know. Well, I, I could have done something else, but anyway, what am I? What am I talking in circles like? we like blah. I'm here, so um, yeah. I don't know if I have much else to say because because the court. Oh, Chevy said um, both schizoaffective and schizophrenia, and I'm told. Um, well, yeah, and you're told multiple personality disorder. That sounds like a, like one whacked idea. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I hear you because that's what you were told, but it doesn't make any sense to me, just saying. You said, I had no idea. He never confided in me. That's just what the newspaper said. They're scared. We're all terrified. Well, I mean, yeah, because with schizophrenia, um, they don't necessarily get held accountable, do they? By the law, I don't think. Not like people with BPD or NPD would. Um, and, uh, or maybe for a time, and but not for as long as, you know, other people would. Um, and then there's always that, you know, um, unfortunate dance of trying to get them properly medicated in the case of schizophrenia. And then they can do really well, 
but then when they feel better they tend to stop the medication and then this this for not all people but a lot of people with schizophrenia never mind the rest of that supposed diagnosis um it 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 can be like um when they're on meds when they're on their meds taking them properly or not can be the difference between somebody living or dying that's around them or related to them so and i know um a couple years ago where i'm living right now we had a person there's one across i shouldn't say there's one like you know but there's a person that lives across the hall those people are chaotic and there's a lot of stuff going on in there but the one woman like is obviously schizophrenic I've just learned how to be able to identify that even if they're not, you know, in the hall yelling at themselves or, or somebody that they they think is there. But there was there was a person with schizophrenia at the end of the hall and a couple of years ago, and I won't go into it for much, but um, they were, apparently had, it was a man, and he terrorized a lot of women on several floors in here. Well, I'm just not that kind of woman that gets terrorized, right? I'm like, what's up with this? And then I, but he said something, like, I opened my door one day, and he was leaning in, his face was right there, like, he was, like, he had his ear up to the door, and I'm like, nothing's going on around my door, because, like, I'm not sitting beside the door, but anyway, a long way from it, but I opened up, and then, and then I'm like, I just kind of backed up, like, you know, and he was there, and that was weird, and then he started talking, and that got weirder, and I'm like, whatever, and I was just trying to be friendly, and then I'm like, this is weird, and then he said some really weird things, like something about childhood and playgrounds, and then said something about axes and so many kneecaps, and I don't remember what else, and I'm like, I heard that, and I'm like, okay, fine, like, I need this person to get away from me really quick. And then, you know, I phoned, I phoned down to, it was a different, we, we've had a change of building manager since, but I phoned down at the time, and I'm like, yeah, this person... Because, cause, you know, I mean, I wasn't terrified or anything, but we do have this kind of floaty, weird sort of tenant right that says you have the, you know, you have a right to the quiet, reasonable enjoyment of wherever you live, which can be, like, interpreted in many different ways. I'm like, dude's head up against my door, let alone what dude said, um, kind of infringing my quiet, reasonable enjoyment at this point. Because I'd like to be able to open my door and step out of it at that point in time, right? That was like 2018 or whatever. Um, without having to encounter somebody's face right in my face. Anyway, when I called downstairs, they said, oh, yes, well, we're aware of him. And he's, you know, and they said, we, he's got schizophrenia and we deal with his worker. And right now he's off his meds. And I'm like, well, is anybody doing anything to get him back on his meds? And then the next time I would see him, because he, he said also, he goes, I walked the halls. And I'm like, oh, that sounds lovely. And then, because you can't, you know, unfortunately, they got the meds. You can't, you, you need to keep yourself safe. You need to give a wide berth. You need to, because you just, you, I'm not saying all people with schizophrenia are going to do something. But you never know. So that's what I was aware of, the never know factor. And then the next time I saw him come, and meanwhile, a couple of people that deliver to me semi-regularly when I when I get things from this, you know, this courier company, and I was doing that before, because I'm too busy to go running around after it, now it's a different world, and whatever, but like, one, one of the delivery guys was afraid of the guy, because every time he'd come out, you know, like, to, to come up in the hall, the guy would be there, so I saw the guy coming halfway down the hall one day, and I just, I was, I think I was waiting on a delivery, so that's why I opened the door, because, yeah, and I just looked at him, and I said, you. I said, stop right there. I said, because if you want to walk the halls or whatever it is you do, do it on that half of the building. Don't, you don't have no need to come down here. I said, and stay away from my door and stay away from me. That was the last time I really ever saw him come down this way. So maybe I scared him, which, you know, that, that doesn't, wouldn't feel pleasant. But bottom line was, I didn't want him around me. So, and I don't understand how they could... Um, Diagnose somebody with schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. Because this DID thing's way out of control. Because first you have to start with the premise and understanding of the reality that it's freaking rare. So how come all of a sudden everybody would, like, people with BPD and schizophrenics and this and that. Next thing you know, oh, I don't know, a house in your neighborhood's going to get, you know, there's going to be this thing called multiple house disorder where the house thinks it's like several houses i'm just being ridiculous because so too is the thought 
that DID or what we used to be called multiple personality disorder is just part of everything all of a sudden. That would be the APA up to their nonsense pseudoscience with a hegemony of big pharma, right? Um, Dennis said, hey, can you say hi to me? Yeah. Oh, it's not Dennis. It's dinner. Okay. Hi there. And Chevy, um, I think I'm helping this other one. Um, I think I'm helping the other one. No, this other one. I tell myself I am anyway. <clears throat> What good is that? Hobby suggestions. Please laugh out loud. Pardon me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first, I have to understand what you're saying. I think I'm helping this other one. I tell myself I am anyway. What good is that? I'm not sure what you mean by that, so I can't tell you how good that is or not in that sense. And hobby suggestions, please. Well, you know, you have to figure out what you're interested in. You know, but... Uh, I, I, you know, hey, I ha what, what hobbies? Well, you know, I'm not big on hobbies. I have stuff I do. I have things I'm interested in. Um, hobbies. Probably for me, it's like, if you can call music a hobby, uh, sports. Uh, and now, you know, I used to play and all that. But, of course, now I'm old and, like, yeah, we know I'm... I'm what am I called out there? The big fat whale, whatever, whatever. Um, we're working on that. But, um... Yeah, like I like watching sports. I guess another hobby of mine would be I just like gathering information on things. So that that might sound weird, but it actually is kind of a hobby. I mean, not just a hobby, but in some other areas, a hobby. Um, I probably do some other. Well, yeah, guitar when when I'm not in the shape I'm in right now. Play guitar. Um, I wouldn't say my, I don't know if it's right to say that your pets or having fun with your pets is a hobby. Because, yeah, I don't think that's exactly it. But anyway. Yep, I wasn't raised on a hobby farm. So uh, <laughs> I shouldn't get into the subject of hobbies, although there are things that I do. So there you go. Uh, but people need to identify what their interests are so that they can start to cultivate hobbies for themselves. Or interests, or could lead to volunteer work, could lead to lots of different things, right? Um... And I don't know if this is, a, but, but comedy is probably another one of my hobbies. I just love comedy. So that's like watching stand-up comedy or something like that. I don't know if that's a hobby. Like what, what qualifies as a hobby or not, right? Like does it have to be gardening? Does it have to be like skiing or like, um, I don't know. A lot of people, well, I don't know if people call going to the gym a hobby either. But yeah, I don't know. Wow, I'm hobbying myself um, in circles here. And getting nowhere. Anyway. Um, Chevy, I'm really um, rooting for you, AJ. I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate and respect you. I gotta go eat dinner. Yeah, well, have a good dinner. And um, you said he wasn't found... Uh, thank you for your kind words, by the way. You said he wasn't found to... Um, competent to stand trial no he's already on the civil side of the hospital sends um the friend request oh goodness that's not comfortable um but if he can still send you friend requests guess what this should be like block for a different reason but block yes um you said incompetent but i don't know what will happen hipaa law it's medical that he stalks me Oh, well, uh, you definitely shouldn't be letting him have access to communicating with you in any way, shape, or form. Because if you haven't already had a restraining order, then that's going to be the next thing you have to look at. And um, and I don't know what they do with somebody with schizophrenia if they stalk. Like, it's, it's t it, yeah, it's a difficult area of law. Um Well, I, I don't know, because I think DID, like, you know, ever since, I forget which one it was, but ever since that one prolific, really famous case was debunked, like, seriously, I don't even know why DID is still on the books. Well, I guess I do get it. It's it's it's, it's the agenda of the APA again with Big Pharma. You know, like, because they want to shove it now, like, BPDs, like DID, it's crazy stuff. And let me just state again. They don't prove any of this stuff. So they make more money when they fuse a lot of stuff together because they sell a lot of, you know, um, 
I think it, I think it, you know, like, frankly, I'm at the point where I almost don't even believe it exists because it's just getting fused into everything. It was, ex it, it, it's always been exceedingly rare. But if it's really something that's going on, which, by the way, it would be a standalone diagnosis. Like, somebody would have DID, period. It kind of takes other stuff off the table. I mean, I don't know about schizophrenia, but point being that, yeah, if somebody really had it, then it it should be able to be assessed from the outside. But uh, let me just give you a little hint. So when I had BPD and when I would be seeing some social workers and agencies and I was, you know, when I was quite young, uh, I don't think I ever thought that I had DID. I don't think that I lied that I had DID. I don't think I implied that I had DID. But there were social workers, okay, so they weren't really bright. One day, I yawn in this session, and the person leans forward in their chair and looks at me like extra special, like googly and weird, and um, google-eyed, and uh, I'm like, what is with this person? And then she says to me, who am I talking to now? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, who am I talking to now? So I say again, what are you talking about? We do that for a little bit, right? And then she says, well, because because I, you know, I don't know what happened or did I yawn again or whatever happened, but nothing happened to me. I was still in congruent time unfolding. And she said, well, because I think you have a, you had an altar that just, I'm like, the hell I did. No, I didn't. But see, this is the other thing. If they're looking for something, then they can make it seem like it is what it is and go with that. And, and, and there was nothing like that happening from me, ever. Nothing like that ever happened. Never lost time, had some dissociation, but never lost time. Always knew what, you know, where I was. I'll just say quickly that, so, so that therapist, you know, well, therapist, I don't know, social worker, was goofy. I never went back after that. But I did, well, I went back to the agency of a different social worker. And I remember a different um, series of sessions, and one in which... I totally dissociated. I don't remember what we were talking about. But I, when I say totally, I shouldn't put it that way. I dissociated to the point where I was really experiencing, re-experiencing my eight-year-old self and around an issue and a trigger. So, but while I was experiencing that, let me clearly say, I, all, I knew where I was. I knew what city I was in. I knew what day it was. I knew what time it was. I knew that I wasn't really eight years old, but that was pretty much like feeling predominant. And then I watched the social worker freak out and run to a supervisor, come back in and go, she just looked like she had no clue what to do. And I mean, and I remember all this because I said, I'm feeling eight. And, and then I was expressing some emotion, but I knew that. And so then she comes in, she goes, well, do you want me to call you an ambulance? And so I'm still feeling eight and experiencing eight in the, you know, that and, and whatever I was feeling in the dissociation. But the other part of me that was still there said, well, what do you mean call me an ambulance? Are you out of your mind? I don't need an ambulance. I needed help to ground myself. But like, they were just running around in circles. Like, but see, so... I just question the skill of people that will make these crazy diagnoses or the the uh, motivation for said, right? And I don't think in that case, like when, when I dissociated, that was maybe aside from all the reliving of sexual abuse memories in the middle of just sitting in a group and all of a sudden, boom. Um, but like I knew where I was still, so I never dissociated to the point where it could be like anything like DID. In spite of some stupid social worker looking at me after I yawned, because oh, yawning would be the yeah. Every time somebody yawns, they're all switching personalities. Apparently, now I yawn and she's like, "Who am I talking to now?" And I'm like, "This woman's off for trip." I'm like, "What do you mean?" Like I said, and after about three, what do you mean? And she said the same thing. I said, "Like me, you know, like." The person that walked in here at whatever time it was, and you know, crazy. So, um, and, uh, and you said, you, Chevy, I'm not allowed to know his condition or situation. I can go visit if I dared. 
Uh, no, hell no, I would think not. So you should make sure you're not contactable. Though he did say you live in a small place, but still, you have to take care of yourself. And um, Justin, I'm an info junkie. Yeah, I, I can relate to that too, but I, I can equally turn it off as fast as I pursue it though. That's an important thing because couldn't always do that. That might be a little bit about the Asperger's in me, which I know it's not called that anymore, but those of us with Asperger's, we don't care what the APA calls it. Um, and the way that everybody gets it all mixed up with everything in Cluster B, which is just inane, like so much out there. And um, Chevy said he got so weird. Um, I literally dodged a bullet that night. It was Christmas, and I ducked out. Well, oh, thank God for that. And you said, so then I find myself in the cycle of finding the next bad guy to, quote, protect me, unquote. And I've come to realize I'm seeking um, these types out, so that's why you're unavailable. Well, yeah, and I mean, you know, make sure you always have a charged phone with 911 on speed dial, right? I mean, it's unfortunate because I, I don't know that you could get a restraining order if, you know, they... If they're out and they, because of the fact that, yeah, they're not being legally held accountable, but that, yeah. You know what I'd really suggest to you? You should move. That would be the safest thing, really, like out of that town. But everybody can't just pick up and move all the time. And Ace, for a certain type of person, I don't think there is any such thing as a hobby. The delineation between work defined as necessary, perhaps, and hobby is blurred. Um, that, yeah, that could be true. And I don't have hobbies. At least I don't have the experience of hobby. Well, I hear you, and, that, and that's, everybody's different. And I mean, I think I do, but I think I think of hobbies as like, I don't know, sort of like, I'm not sure what I think of hobbies. Um, I think I have a few. Like, I used to have more. Like, I used to do oil painting. Like, that's a hobby. Uh, by numbers, by the way. I'm no artist, so oil painting by numbers. Um, or, uh, yeah, like I might still crochet once in a blue moon. So, like, that's like a hobby. But, I mean, I never get to it anymore. And, of course, all I can crochet is blankets. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Blankets. I can't do anything but blankets. So, that was a miracle in and of itself. But So, those, those are like a couple of hobby things. Or... Somebody might knit or um, somebody might garden. Like gardening could be a functional necessity or something, but, but it could also be a hobby for somebody. <coughs> and um, Chevy said, uh, they don't just hand out the diagnosis, but they don't just hand out hospital stays for murder like that, right? Well, you know, I... I couldn't really tell you, right? Like, I don't know everything for sure. But I haven't come across anything that would be evidentiary to me that would indicate any kind of coexisting schizophrenia with, with multiple personality disorder. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but I would really question the diagnosis. I, I would really, really would. Because, you know, there, there's like a whole motivation of agenda with the APA with this stuff. Because what are they going to say next? Well, maybe the schizophrenia, the schizophrenic in, in this person isn't the real host. Or this personality or this alter has... This is where it's going, okay? As crazy as it sounds, because it is crazy. Oh, this person with DID, well, this alter has BPD and this one has NPD. And, the, and this is all asinine stuff, Okay. But, but but I've seen people talk about it out there like that. It, it's like there's no basis for it whatsoever. So, um, but, you know, that's, that's the best I can do with the topic. And Chevy said they're changing laws around him and another man in the state of uh, Washington. Do they call it the state of the Washington? I don't think they do. I know, probably a typo. He said it's interesting. It also sounds kind of scary, to be honest with you. And a DID can't be discussed in the absence of structure. Well, fragmented, destructured structure. Otherwise, the concept is more something for the individual's use to self-assess, metacognition, and so on. Yeah, but metacognition has nothing to do with different personalities. Um, 
uh, ace. Yeah, it's the old, quote, prove you're sane, unquote. <laughs> and um, Chevy, I couldn't tell you. He had a wild imagination but never told me he was unwell. I just knew it. No. Nah. You'd think that if he really had uh, multiple personalities, that you might have figured that out, too. Just saying, you know. Um, Ace, quote, ah, yes, that was an altar there. You don't realize because not knowing is a part of your illness. You are what I say you are. Believe in me. Submit to me. Well, yeah, that I don't think that social worker really had that agenda. She was just apparently the one that, uh, not why I was seeing her, but after I didn't want to see the other social worker in that agency, they sent me to this one. And she was the one that would work with people with DID because, yeah, they came in the door every 10 minutes. Like, no. But, you know, I knew she was, like, crazy because I was me the whole time. And I, di I didn't indicate or manipulate or lie or suggest otherwise, right? That was good. I yawned because I was tired and probably freaking bored at the same time. And, um, and she's like, who am I talking to now? And, and I should have said, well, who the hell am I talking to? Because like, what is wrong with you? You know, but anyway, Chevy, I do block him absolutely every time. Um, how come you can't just block him once and get it over with or change your phone or whatever the case? Uh, and he said, I don't want to get a restraining order. I want him to forget I'm alive. And he said, this was at, well, it's been 11, what is that, 10, 11, I can't count, but it's been, yeah, 11 years. I don't think he's going to forget you're alive, unfortunately. 11 years later, doesn't have a memory issue, I guess. Or he's got a supersonic ultra, uh, no, super, supersonic ultra hiding in the background that has, uh, what do you call it, uh, that, uh, what do you call it, you know, that memory that never goes away. I can't even remember it. I have a pretty good memory, but I can't remember. Uh, I hope you know what I mean. Photographic memory. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Because I have a little bit of that, but like, <laughs> obviously it's not working so well when I can't remember what it's called. I don't have it like entirely 100%, but you know, just saying. Um, Ace, no one ever put DID or anything on me. But I had to consider the notion. Well, it wasn't really put on me either, except for what she said that day. It was like never in my mental health chart. Because I've, I've read all those notes and I've gone through. I, I still have one thing I should go fix, but it, it had nothing to do with DID. It was, it was the BPD, NPD alcoholic that I saw a few times in her office for absolutely, like, was no good reason. Um, and, it was no, and I didn't need therapy. That's not why I was there. But there was no therapy happening anyway. And she wrote something down in my file. I think that wasn't true, but I haven't bothered to go back since then. But I've read my whole mental health file. And what I hate about it is when you want to go read it, you have to make an appointment, and then you have to sit in a room with two shrinks. I don't like shrinks, right? I just straight up don't. And so, I mean, I've interviewed a few and known a few that I like, right? But and I've worked with a few, like in this area when I had local clients. But and that's okay. It doesn't mean I like them though necessarily, or if I get to know them. But so you have to sit in there with two shrinks in case, like you read your mental health chart and you fall apart. It's like really. So all, with all this vertical relating, I'm, I'm like thinking, dude, you're probably like you're definitely more insane than I am. If somebody here is insane. But what you can do in this province is you can write objections to the notes that are written. And I wrote a few objections. I mean, there were things I understood and things that made sense. And then there was editorializing by, and it was nothing like, it wasn't other diagnoses. It was just misreported aspects of things that happen. I think primarily when I was in the transference focused psychotherapy. So... Yeah, I don't know. But it was nothing, no big deal. But um, systemically, though, you have to, like, systems can really screw up a lot of things. So, um, and you said uh, you have to consider the notion. And in doing so, you have to develop a sense of what constitutes and, quote, identity, unquote, a state, how one states become another. Yeah, or like lots of us out here, we don't have to do that. Because I know I'm just me. And if I, if I have different feelings, 
they don't even really evolve into entire feeling states. And they're certainly not self-states, and they're definitely not alters. Because, you know, I can feel one way, I don't feel one way. You know what I mean? But, like, like when I was grieving, for example, and in those videos where I shared a bit of grieving, I mean, and, and whatnot. I mean, I was not, I, I was emotional, I was grieving, I was in pain, I was also still fairly clear-headed. So, you know, I mean... I'm not saying you're doing this, Ace, but there's there's a lot of wanting to do out there, like people are saying when they're giving misinformation on channels. Like, everybody is narcissistic. That's not true. Everybody is, um, what's the other everybody I've heard a lot of? Everybody has BPD traits. No. Everybody has a human traits that they pathologize into the definition of BPD. Things like that. And, um... Actually, that's not how it works in normality, straight up, Ace. It isn't. You know, like, we, we people that we are one person, and then when we've done the, you know, some shadow work, but the self-integrative work of the wounded inner child, etc. Um, no, there aren't all these wacko, like, well, I shouldn't say wacko. I don't mean wacko. That's the wrong word. There aren't all these, like, you know, separated kind of like, like in my daily life, I mean, I'm, I'm me. And whatever I'm feeling, I'm aware of what I'm feeling. And it's part of me. It's just me. It's just not more complicated than that. That's what it is for more people than not. Um, well, there's a whole other thing going on in the world right now about what can be hijacked right now or suppressed by authoritative collectivist nonsense because we're all being made medical patients even if we don't need to be. But that's a little bit different. But still pretty dastardly. Um, Chevy, I don't know. I, I legit think he had DID just because he got so strange and was trying so hard to act normal. Well, that's trying to reverse engineer. I don't know. But aside from the imagination, he carried a different posture and look in his eyes for every occasion. Well, that may be it. That might not be it. But I don't know. Um... And a, a things in their natural course, thinking about it now, I guess we might be in agreement. Perhaps exposure to the DID concept can be um, a disruptive. Well, I think it could be disruptive. Um, didn't bother me because she was nuts, frankly. Um, Chevy, I did move four hours away. Stupid me didn't realize the hospital is 45 minutes from here. Oh, no. I've spoken with the sheriff when he sent me the last friend's request um, last Thanksgiving. Again happened, um, 2010. Oh. And he said, gosh, he was interesting. I shouldn't play with matches. We're all so interesting, though. Well, there's a point at which somebody is, you know, toxic, and that might still be interesting, but it's time to remember that curiosity might have taken the cat out, so to speak. Um, and, um, hi there, is that Amy? I'm not sure. Um, you said, I hope you're well. Yeah, I'm doing reasonably well, thank you. Uh, I sent you an email with a similar question, but I just saw you were online, so I'll take the chance to ask something similar here. Okay. Are you aware of the construct of, yes, I never say it right, but do you know how often it co-occurs with BPD and are quiet BPD? Well, I don't know if anybody really knows, like, how often it occurs, um, because it really wouldn't, really wouldn't occur for everybody with BPD, because, again, there are individual differences. Whoops, what did I just, oh, okay, thought I dropped something there. So, um, yeah, just give me a second here, because... Um, uh, what you said, am I aware of the construct? Yes. Um, but you know, I don't think anybody knows, as I just said, how often it co occurs with BPD or quiet BPD because I think sometimes people think, I think some people out there think they just go together automatically, which isn't really the case. And, um, Okay, so what else can I say about that? Let me think. Um, it, it, you know, the other thing about that construct, it's a, it's a very broad construct, right? So, 
So how would somebody, you know, it's difficult to ascertain. I wish I could say it, but, you know, alexithymia or whatever. Like, I'm just not good at pronouncing things. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's like a problem of feelings and emotions, right? So um, it kind of, like, means that there's no words for the emotion. And, and that can be, you know, whatever that means, is that like a full-on different thing? Or is that something that's happening for people, even with codependency or BPD, or, you know, that they can't really um, figure out or understand their emotions? So I think they estimate that like one, but, but these are just estimates, right? Stats really suck. One in ten people might have that. Um... So emotions are, yeah, a big mystery to these people. And what else did you ask about that? Um, and actually, yeah, not even everybody with that has difficulty expressing their emotions. So, I mean, how reliable is that as a construct on its own, let alone with other things? So it can be secondary to BPD. Um, and did you ask about, oh yeah, well, okay, BPD or quiet BPD? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a pretty problematic construct. Because, you know, people can express, have difficulty expressing their emotions, but then also that doesn't mean necessarily that people have difficulty expressing their emotions. So when you think about that, what does that construct really end up meaning if it's if it's not some kind of congruent, consistent, like if somebody says, well, somebody's diagnosed with that, then it means this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. So it can also be attributed to or seen in some autism, um, but I don't know what the difference would be between BPD and quiet BPD as it comes to this construct of I can't say it right. When it comes to the idea of if they're aware of their emotions or what they're, you know, like how to break down their emotions or not, because, you know, there's so much difficulty with emotional dysregulation and BPD, period, no matter whether quiet or any other subtype. Um, yeah, I don't really think I have a good answer for that because I don't know if there's a good answer out there for that that's in any kind of evidence or, you know, stat configuration. And then you said, are you aware of, uh, no, I read that. Um, you said, I was in a relationship with a woman who had it severely and trauma, and now I'm starting to think it's very possible she had quiet BPD. Well, she might well have because cause that construct all by itself isn't as reliable as what we kind of know about people with BPD and their emotions. So, you know, yeah, I mean, but I can't, figure out a way to kind of deconstruct it to say that it would be more with quiet BPD versus any other subtype of BPD or not, right? So, and you said, I'm now trying to navigate the huge hurt I'm in after the recent breakup. I was, I was codependent. So do you mean you were codependent or you still are codependent? Uh, but yeah, like I probably wasn't too helpful there because truthfully, it's kind of like a really wiggly construct, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and Chebby, when they ask me if I hear voices, I tell them, I don't know. Oh. And you said, I believe the sheriff said he will go to prison when he's found competent to stand trial. That's not what the newspapers say. Well, that's interesting because wouldn't that also have something to do with, um, if there's any, what's that called in law? You know, like the time frame, like, of, ah, oh, wow, I must be tired. Um, I can't think of anything right now. Statute of limitations, that's what I'm, that's it. So, would there be any statute of limitations on the fact that he committed murder? And would that matter by the time he gets around to being assessed as competent? Like, I don't know. It's just a question. Obviously, I wouldn't know the answer to that. But that could be a problem, I'm thinking. But maybe not. 
So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Ace. I finally did get it out. Yes. Um, probably just because it is a little hot in here and I'm a little tired. Because normally I would have the air conditioner on, so. Which I will again soon, but anyway. Yeah, so I don't know. Like, it's interesting. Like, because, you know, to Amy, if I said your name right, um, if you figure that this person has quiet BPD, no matter how you got there, then that's that's probably what you'd be best off to to kind of go by, right? What you experienced and, and yeah, that if they had quiet BPD rather than the thing that Lord knows I can pronounce sometimes and not others. Um, Marcus, uh, there is generally no statute of limitations on murder. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Because as I said that, I thought, there might well not be, right? But I just, yeah, thank you for adding that, because I wouldn't know. That would be, um, I think, well, I guess maybe relatives of that person would want to see him held responsible if he's competent, but that would, of course, bring it all back up again, and that might be really difficult. So, difficult situation all the way around, um, which doesn't really have anything to do with the topic, because getting back to that, that's certainly different than people with codependency and denial and thinking that, you know, and the other thing I was going to say about that, too, is the idea that somebody could just improve their self-esteem uh, with codependency. I mean, you can do it, but, you know, it depends. Not everybody with codependency has it to the same degree. But um, self-esteem, interestingly enough, is really overblown. Like, I'm not saying it's not important, but I think self-worth is more important than self-esteem. But, you know, that is just my take on it. But And a lot of people pinpoint that, you know, because I think it's more important to think about uh, for people with codependency who might still be... Um, I have phones falling all over the place here. <laughs> um, not ringing, that's a good thing. But I think people who have codependency might need to think a little bit more about where's your self-respect more than where's your self-esteem, right? And and remember, when I say that, it's not a judgment because a lot of people with codependency, not all, um, don't have any self-respect, or at least in their emotional landscape they don't because maybe never taught that in childhood. So again, not everybody with codependency is going to be exactly the same either. And so, um, yeah, I need to practice saying things, but I know, like, I just trip over words. It's so stupid. I can read them in a heartbeat, but maybe it's because I don't usually say them that often. I don't know. It's like even in philosophy, I, I do know a fair bit about philosophy. I'm not saying I'm an uber philosopher or whatever at all, but yeah, I still get the names all screwed up just because, I guess, you know, I don't really know why. But uh, like Marcus there is using Marcus Aurelius, but then maybe I didn't say that exactly right either. But I do know it's a philosopher. So I think the main, you know, the main thing just maybe in summary here is to say that there isn't a way to make these relationships better. And that as people were talking about earlier, you know, the best thing is to go no contact, is to move forward, is for the person with codependency to get in their own healing recovery from the relationship and family of origin, etc. And the codependency, obviously. And for people with BPD to get into their own treatment. And, you know, it's interesting because in our last live stream when I was really focusing on, you know, dichotomies, black-white thinking, and that's going on all over the place, and people are stuck in, like, there's also a dichotomy in cognitive dissonance, right? So if you're in the good half of cognitive dissonance, then you're stuck in a dichotomy. If you're in the bad half, you're stuck in that dichotomy. And and people need to, you know, be in therapy and work these things out so that there's um, paradox instead of dichotomies. But what was I going to say about that? Um, gee, I started off talking about dichotomy again for a reason and then lost my point because I, yeah, go sideways. This way instead of that way. Um, I think the codependent denial in itself is dichotomous, you know, because it's protective and because there's something that people must, it must be also a facet of the cognitive dissonance that 
people are still thinking more about the good, which is, you know, like the white of the black, right? The black of the white. It's the white of the black. So dichotomous thinking driven by feelings is still like a huge block to so many people who might think that there's a way to come back together in a relationship. Oh, and I know my major point was going to be that, well, there's all these, you know, d dichotomous thinking going on, all these blocks and people's processes and all these areas, that the one thing that isn't, no, the one thing that is, rather, meant to be or is more accepted as a black and white construct or reality or experience, believe it or not, is a relationship breakup. However, having said that, obviously that's not the case when you're trying to survive a BPD relationship breakup, right? Because it's more unique, it's more nuanced, it's difficult, it's much more painful, it's complex. But in your average everyday sort of healthier or whatever relationships out there, when people break up, more often than not, that's going to be a black and white experience. Whether there's some mutuality to it, even when, they, but, but another, well, no, I'll save that for another time about closure and whatever. But I think it's really important to realize that, you know, there's, when, when a relationship is over or ending or you've been abused, etc., it needs to be black and white. It needs to be this cut, cut off, no contact, stop it. That's actually healthy. So for all the things about black and white and dichotomous, this and that, the relationship breakup is supposed to be that. It's healthy for it to be that. But of course, in BPD, not going to be that simple. I mean, in, you know, with codependence and BPD exes, <clears throat> or almost exes, or on and off again exes. And um, Amy, I think you pronounced uh, well. Oh, good. So I won't say it again because I won't. But, you know, usually, yeah, I know it, but it just, I don't know. Sometimes my mouth is on its own path, right? I don't know how to explain it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't worry about it. I just do my best. And sometimes I'll talk all around it. Like, you know, I said it once, and if I got it right, good. I know what it is. and But like, yeah, I just sometimes don't pronounce things so, so well. Not that many things, just certain things. And then you said, I know um, I need therapy after the breakup. As it was very traumatic, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm a college student, and I'm trying to find the most financially smart way to go. What is your advice on this? Um, I don't really know what to say because it's it's got to be very difficult if you're a student. So now I think I'm recalling your email. So I'm not sure if it's email I have in my mind or not, but I will. I'll reply to you an email. How about that? Because I do remember an email with that question and everything. So, yeah, I just don't always get to emails right away. And then, to, to, to just put out a little bit of information, I, don't, I can't always answer emails that are asking questions separate from if somebody's asking anything else that's relevant to maybe a session or something. So a lot of times people will write me a lot of things and if there was, I don't know, 45 hours in a day, maybe I could get to those emails. So just want to let people know that, that I do read emails I get, and I wish I could reply to them all, but, but I can reply to yours, Amy. And But, like, I can't reply to all, and the thing is, so I just hope people understand that. And, um, yeah, I don't think it's a stature limit, but I get what you mean. Um... Yeah, no, I think Marcus kind of cleared that up too, yeah. Makes sense. I don't think murder holds a limitation. Yeah, no, I... When I thought about it, I didn't really think so either, but then, you know, I don't know, because law is different everywhere, and I... Actually, you know, I was going to say I've had nothing to do with that crime. Of course, I haven't taken anybody's life or anything like that, but... I did have a good friend when I was a grade, uh, no, she was, yeah, she was my good friend in grade seven and through to grade eight until we moved away. And then when I moved back to the city that we moved away from, um, so when I went, went back to Toronto and went back to university, I mean, to go to university, then uh, we met up again. And um, so I was 17, about to turn 18, and she was 18. And it was great to see her again, and we were like picking up our friendship. 
And she actually got killed. She got murdered in a schoolyard. And that was, and I heard it on the radio. I mean, I'll never forget that night. I was like in the dorm and I laid down to go to bed and I had my little clock radio on. And all of a sudden it said the body of, and her name was, and I was just like, oh my God. You know, like it was just like, there was a lot of people around to go and be hysterical and get a little support from because I was shocked. And so that that's the only way in which, like I knew somebody who got killed like that. So it was, it was a terrible experience. And I mean, you know, God, it was, it was so sad. And I actually still think of her every once in a while, all these years later. And, um, and Chevy said, uh, but does helping the other man with BPD fix the other schizo? No, it's like guilt, grief, survivor syndrome. I'm not sure what you're talking about because I think you're just trying to, for some reason, make codependency sound like a bunch of stuff when it is what it is. I don't know. Um, well, nothing is simple about being codependent, but yeah, it's in the realm of codependency, I think, what you're talking about. And Amy said, yes, it was my email. Please don't worry about replying right away. Uh, take all the time you need. Well, thank you. I generally, you know, I can't do things faster than I can do them. So, because, you know, one of the things, too, I don't, I mean, why would people think of this, right? But, so, I have a lot of clients at any one given time, and then new people are always coming in, and so... I try to schedule, and I have to schedule by region, by time zones, all these different things, because people all around the world. And then, you know, I'll propose a time, and somebody might say, no, that doesn't work for me, and that's understandable. And then I'll propose another time. And when that's happening, though, I have some clients where things are just more difficult to line up. And then I wonder if they remember how many other people I'm dealing with, right? So somebody else, somebody emailed me today and said, and then, you know, no no offense to this person or client of mine, but they said, well, I'll just, uh, no, that won't work either. And so I'll wait till you email me another suggestion. And, and I'm like, people have to be their own advocate and take responsibility in this process with me. So I'm just going to put this out here. You know, if I, so if somebody does want to book a session with me and you purchase, and then I email you and we either hook up right away, great, you know, or it works for your schedule and mine, or not. But then don't be afraid to email me back and go like, so I have this and this open. Does this work with you? Because I wrote that person. The person just said to me, I'll wait for you to suggest another time. And I'm like, I don't have all day, every day to do this all day with one person, let alone all the people. I've so I just wrote back and I said, could you please rather than wait for me to get back to you, could you please send me a couple of days and times in the next week or two that you would be available? And then I could look at my schedule and see if something works, right? So, yeah, because I think sometimes people just don't remember that I'm not just dealing with them. And I don't mean to say there's anything, you know, it, it, it's just people are focused on themselves and when is their appointment going to be in, and, and that's quite understandable. And... um Oh, Marcus said, projecting outward doesn't work. Pursue less, spend the time and money on therapy. Yeah, that's really good advice, Marcus. You know, it's, it's true. And, uh, and maybe for some people that's a little harder than for others. But, you know, and then it reminds me that there's, I don't know if there's one or more YouTubers out there who say, but and you can get therapy free online. Well, I don't know where that is, but, um, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying that you have to, yeah, but what would free therapy really be like? How 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 much efficacy would there be to that? Because you know, I would just wonder what is their experience and what what are they used to dealing with if it's free, or what is their source of funding, and does everybody have access to whatever that would mean? All I can tell you from my experience in therapy over the years years ago was a couple of things I mentioned about that agency with the social workers. Like those people were not helpful at all. I'm just saying. And yeah, when I went to the agency with the social workers, no, I didn't have to pay for it. And so I should have worked at that point, but I was a student then too, but I should have worked with somebody in private practice because they would have helped more at that point in time than the agency people. And then I'd just like to say, I'm not lumping all people together because there are some people, social workers that work in agencies the way that they're structured up here, you can get the odd one. And maybe that's older. That's really sharp and, and might be really good in certain areas. But, 
I remember one time having a student in one of those. Oh, my God, that was hilarious. Yeah. I didn't know whether I just wanted to, like, upset her whole day because I was getting no help or what. That was, like, yeah. And that was not the beginning, but early on. And Tom said, the person I was involved with, um, you suspect has BPD, is suddenly trying to make a living doing porn, um, fans or only fans or whatever. I don't know what that means, but, um, I mean, generally, but not specifically. Can you talk about what kind of a relationship a person with BPD might have with porn? Uh, well, again, lots of people with BPD don't have any relationship with it. And some, whether male or female with BPD, will have an extensive relationship with it and with other sorts of types of services out there as well when, the, you know, the world wasn't like it is at the moment. Um, and that really basically more, you know, primarily with people with BPD goes back to early childhood, mainly sexual abuse, but other kinds of abuse or trauma. And so it's not, um, not unheard of that there can be that connection there. Um, but it's not like with BPD comes that ipso facto automatically, right? So, um, it can be very extensive for people who are sexual abuse survivors, not all, but some. So really, other than that, I can't really say a lot because, because you know, there are people with BPD they are going to get into that. Of course, there are many people who don't have BPD who are involved in porn to one degree or another. And, um, and then the other thing, too, is that I would think that there are some narcissists out there to get involved in doing that if they're doing that like in a sort of a membership, however they do that online kind of thing. And so for the narcissist, it would be supply needs, right? And and for people with BPD, it often goes back to trauma. Not that it couldn't go back to trauma for a narcissist too, but obviously not exactly in the same way. And Amy, also, does having a malignant narcissist father increase the chances of BPD in his children? Is there a statistical correlation? Well, their, their stats aren't worth anything, if you know what I mean, really. But um, I would say there's a correlation, though. There's a, like, I can say from all the people I've worked with over years, there's a correlation that um, either people have BPD or codependency, right? If not NPD. So having um, a malignant narcissist father or mother or, like, you know, a parent um, really is traumatizing for their children, right? And then even into adulthood if you're the adult child if you haven't done your um, healing recovery work. So there is a correlation. Um, it's not maybe, I mean, I can't give you numbers or anything, but I would say that there'd be a higher correlation to a borderline or a narcissist, malignant narcissist mother and a child having BPD or NPD. But it, 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 there's, you know, a strong correlation between with a narcissistic father as well. And then it depends because often in families, what we see is, you know, maybe one ends up with codependency, or maybe that's not known, or one ends up with BPD, one's, one ends up with NPD, and maybe one sort of just gets out of there rather, you know, maybe not totally mentally healthy, but not otherwise, like maybe codependency. So, and that goes all to, you know, what happens in those relationships how abusive the malignant narcissist is, whether it's mother or father, and um, the, again, the family dynamics, and and how does that, like a, a malignant narcissist father, again, what is, what is that um, person and what they're doing and how they affect everybody, how they affect like majorly one person, for example, but what are they doing to the whole dynamic of the family system again? So, yeah, but there's a correlation between, let me just say in more general terms, cluster B parents or cluster B mother and, and BPD because it's, it's the amount of trauma that, you know, gets passed on intergenerationally in that regard. And the only other thing, and the only thing, I don't even know if the, if the APA pseudoscience proved this, but it's been long, well, neuroscience kind of tells us more about this that the more sensitive a temperament a child has at birth, then, you know, that doesn't mean anything from the get-go. 
but match that with a cluster B parent or an invalidating environment or trauma and abuse. And then that's likely to be the person that gets BPD or NPD versus somebody who might have a more resilient temperament who could end up with codependency in these families. So, and in, in, in my family of origin, although I got labeled with it, but yeah, okay, so I had BPD and I believe the golden child is a narcissist. So, but that was two parents cluster B, right? Not just one. So, I don't know. Um... Ace, is there any material you recommend on amnesia, especially in the context of long-term underlying and inescapable suffering? Um, unfortunately, I don't have anything to recommend at the moment because I it's something I'd like to look into more, but I really just haven't had time. And it's something that seems to be um, looked at differently, although they haven't, you know, again, the APA hasn't proven what they'll assert about it. And then in terms of BPD and amnesia, my thoughts are still that I know BPD is morphing and they're pathologizing it more, etc., etc. But I still think that if there's, I never had BPD amnesia. That's all I could say. So what I think is happening more today is that it's aligned with psych psychiatric medications and their effects or side effects. So um, with BPD, I'm saying specifically. But in general, I don't really have any recommendations on that because I haven't really had a lot of time to look more into that, especially the way it's proliferating in the pseudoscience studies anyway on a number of fronts. Like so many things are. that they're, but, but these studies, let me just say again from... From American Psychiatric Association with the Hegemony of Big Pharma, they're largely still pseudoscience. To the best of my knowledge, they haven't replicated any yet, and they still don't allow criticism of them. And so without replication and criticism within the like psychiatric profession, let's say, which they won't publish criticism in their journals by other psychiatrists, and then they don't have science, because science requires that rigor. Uh, at the very least, replication documentation, and critique. And if, and if it doesn't get that or stand up to that, it is not science. So that's what's wrong with a lot of these studies, etc. And not all around the world, because some of them are being replicated around the world, but not, to my knowledge anyways, in the, out of the APA. And there's a reason for that. Um, Chevy, please write a book about something else. I'd love to see all sorts of your ideas and thoughts. Please write a book about something else. Well, what would I do? Sit down and write, this is a book about something else. Like, I, I don't know, it's interesting, um, but I don't know what, you know, I, I wouldn't know what, you know, what the, I mean, I'm interested in a lot of things, and I know some stuff about a lot of things, but I'm not saying I'm an expert in every area, that's for sure. But, um, and Chevy, we not only lost his dad, lost him too. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure who you're talking about now, but I'm sorry about that. And you said, I definitely believe I'm codependent, and we'll address this immediately. A new hobby for me found. Well, I don't know that codependence recovery is really a hobby, but it, it definitely needs to be an interest and an active one, right? Um, Justin, I was a golden child, but I'm not a narc. Well, no, and not all golden children are narcissists. Dad was harsher because I was the, quote, chosen one, unquote. Well, yeah, and I hear you, and I would just, I love the emoticons after that, and I would just say that, um, yeah, like, I mean, from me as a former, well, I'm still in the family of origin, the scapegoat, but I mean, whatever, who cares now, um, but, because I got free of that when my mother passed away, I mean, for me, and eh, they'll always think the same, but, um, so whether the scapegoat or the golden child, in most cases, there's a lot of trauma and woundedness on both sides. You know, and the other thing about, um, like, if you're the, the golden child or the chosen one, sometimes you can get a lot more harsh treatment. Depends on the narcissist, so to speak, because sometimes the thing that will happen that creates a narcissist with a narcissistic parent will be like, the, the parent will see them as so much of an extension of themselves they will spoil them and or a codependent parent with a narcissistic parent might try to make up for it. And I, I've had lots of clients who have 
codependency traits of NPD and or like just tip over into NPD, usually fragile, vulnerable, covert. So they can be helped. And, and the thing is, they, they've had like, say, one parent was a narcissist, one parent was a really, you know, uh, severe codependent, and the child gets like spoiled by that parent trying to make up for the other parent, for the narcissist parent. And then maybe even the narcissist parent um, aggrandizes the child, especially if it's an only child, will aggrandize the child because they're, they're seen as an extension of themselves. So and um, so that can be the spoiling effect that can give people narcissistic personality, or they can end up with narcissistic personalities or, as well. Um, so, but but obviously, Justin, that wasn't the case for you, and I'm I'm not saying that to you. I just you know thought of that after what you said, because because not all you know not all scapegoats are going to have BPD. Many will have codependency at the very least. Um, and not all nurse or not all golden children are going to end up with narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and Tom, honest question: Aren't most of us codependent to a certain degree? When does it become unhealthy? Well, I mean, there's sort of like I, w I would separate it out this way: delineate it that there is a sort of a cultural narcissism out there, and I mean, we're under more pressure than ever before with that. When you think about what's going on in the world which is largely, we could say, in the control of, to one degree or another, um, malignant narcissists, narcopaths, and the dark triad trait, you know, beyond that. And so that would then mean, because I think at the very least with what's going on in the world right now, we are being gaslit up the yin-yang, because I don't know what's, I know something's real, but what's the thing? And the Hegelian dialectic is at work like crazy with, with, Create problem, get reaction, offer the solution. I think we're definitely seeing something like that, no matter which way you slice or dice it. So in the ma macrocosm of life right now, this is affecting people's mental health in many ways, right? But it's kind of like they, whoever they are, um, you know, corporatocracy, technocracy, etc., are trying to make patience out of all of us right now and in that and 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 as well as other things what that's doing for many people is creating well all kinds of like stress and depression and all kinds of things but it's an overarching reality of like we're kind of i think a lot of people in in the world are kind of in a fawning codependency response to if you really look into this and you try to figure it out, which I've done, and of course I'm not claiming that I know anything exactly, but I I think I know enough about it to say with accuracy that we're definitely being gaslit along with whatever else, you know. Like where's the truth in all this? I don't know. So in that in that there's cultural narcissism and then there's also uh, narcissism, sorry, cultural codependency. There's also cultural narcissism. But then there's um, this other macrocosm right now situation of we're being um, we're being infantilized, infantilized. See, you never get it right the first time. We're being infantilized by this systemic reality or this systemic whatever it is, and so that can create fawning codependency responses and people that otherwise wouldn't maybe have those issues as much in their individual lives. But so. Yeah, I mean, I know that Melody Beattie, uh, Pia Melody, and her writing on codependency many years ago was basically, she said, 95% of the population. I think there's other people that have written and said that are codependent. But I guess whatever that might mean and whatever I've just said around that as well, it's not the same specifically as when it's like a key core trauma response or adverse experience from your childhood, which is more what we're talking about here in relation to how that leaves that that leads people into relationships with people with BPD or NPD into the trauma bond. So um, that's when it becomes unhealthy is when it's it's been damaging enough in family of origin however it occurred, that somebody, you know, you, you just don't get enough of your emotional needs met when you're um, 
growing up, you know, like in childhood. And you also don't get a strong enough sense of yourself. And you don't get taught boundaries and limits. And there's a lot. And then, and then if they're emotionally, you have an emotionally unavailable parent, you know, you, you end up pursuing them because any child will pursue a parent to try to get seen, heard, and validated, let alone to feel more love or connected to. So I think that that's all of those things I just said are, are the degree to which it's unhealthy because I would like to just, um, put that adjacent to or juxtapose that to the reality that I just spoke about in the macrocosm of the world right now, which is causing a lot of people to have a fawning codependency response. But that fawning codependency response, I wouldn't think is necessarily unhealthy. Because what the hell, what the heck else is our response supposed to be? So I don't know if that helped or not. But And Tom said, like, having people in our lives and wanting to keep them is a good thing sometimes. Can you talk about boundaries? Well, boundaries is a vast and wide and then needs to be applied to each person in their own healing recovery journey. But having people in our lives, yeah, well, having people in our lives and wanting people in our lives, of course, is healthy. But if they're toxic, then it's not healthy. Or if somebody is still, you know, in their own codependence and haven't healed your core childhood woundedness, then there's going to be toxic relating going both ways. So, um... When you said having people in our lives and wanting to keep them is a good good thing sometimes, well, if the person is healthier, right? So, and, and boundaries, I mean, there's various numbers of boundaries and various different iterations of boundaries, and, but um, often in childhood, people that develop codependency, which is an adaptation to at least adverse experience, if not trauma, to some degree or other, then... Um, those family systems don't teach boundaries because they enmesh, they, you, you, you end up enmeshed in a family um, structure um, or, or the family of origin, and then you don't really get to be an individual. So that's why, it's why you don't know yourself as well as you need to and why you're going to have this. People with codependency also have a false self. People have somewhat of a lost self, not as much as BPD or NPD. So... Um, Boundaries that, that, so people with moderate to significant codependency might not be the same. People with severe codependency um, will have like, that will have had their boundaries violated in ways that to the extent that they didn't learn any boundaries in childhood. So, and then it's all of the other unmet needs that go together that when, when, when you meet a borderline and there's that insta thing happening and you're getting seen and heard and validated, it's just people can't, it's like the greatest thing in the world ever. And, and nobody's consciously aware at that moment that that's what you've been waiting for and needing your whole life kind of thing. And so it's probably about the best I could. Boundaries are very like hard to talk about in generalities. And so, um, and, Ed, um, hi, AJ. Sorry to join late. Um, I'm in town for my dad's 90th birthday. His 90th birthday birthday. Well, that is a special uh, birthday birthday. Yeah, 90. That's amazing. I hope it's a happy time. And, um, Matt, um, as a codependent with cluster Bs in my close family, would I expect to lose him if I go through therapy? Is there any way to keep a significant relationship <clears throat> with them afterwards? Well, it would definitely depend on whether they've had therapy or not, right? Because it, it, it depends on their effect on you, uh, the relationship type, like, you know, mother, father versus aunt, uncle, cousin, sibling. But I can only say I can't speak to your specific situation, but I would say more often than not, when there's cluster bees in, in, oh, you said close family. Okay, so when there's cluster bees in the family um, of origin, and if you have codependency, you go to therapy, yeah, there's a good chance that you, you won't be able to maintain those relationships. And it, and it can be for two reasons. One is you're going to realize, maybe you already know, or maybe you realize more about if they're being really abusive to you still, and what role you're still in due to the family of origin. And when you change that, how they're going to have a lot of difficulty with it too. So it's hard to say. It's not like a 100% rule. 
but it just depends on what's happening, how you're experiencing them. And may I just say also very gently with compassion, it's very codependent to be worried about what will happen with those relationships because when you get into the therapeutic process and when you're working this through, what you might discover, what you might feel, what you might get in touch with, it might make it more clear that you might not even care about the question you're asking right now, or certainly not as much as you might right now. So all of that I really can't say for you specifically, but it's you know high likelihood that there could be a lot of flux in how you feel right now versus how you might feel when you get more into that work and that healing, and you and you really look at that woundedness um, that's still inside of your inner child. So it, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's more likely than not that it will vastly change those relationships. And then you have to ask yourself if you think that that isn't already something that you would welcome, that whatever you're experiencing from these people, if they're untreated, you definitely probably need, you know, healthier boundaries and maybe some space, you know, if not the whole nine yards of no contact. But you'll know that more based on your own experience how abusive are they? Are they untreated? What's happened in your childhood? What's been happening in your life? And when you're in your own therapeutic process of recovery, then you'll be able to answer those questions better. So I would just say don't go into, you know, um, therapy for recovery from codependency, etc. And maybe it, your codependency will also involve the dynamics of your family of origin in a bit bigger way. But don't go into it with, any, any like hard and fast rules about, well, this is going to mean that. Because, you know, it will unfold as it needs to in your therapy. And then you'll also be being helped to cope with that and deal with that. And then you'll see where you end up with that. That's probably the best way I can put it. So, so the answer is likely will change relationships to one degree or another for sure. Will it be to the point of no contact or will it be to like really low contact or something that it's hard to say, right? So, um, yeah, I hope that was helpful because I can't really be specific because there's no hard and fast 100%, especially when you don't even know, like I don't know you at all, so I don't know what you've been going through with your family, uh, with cluster bees in the family. And Ed, um, oh, birthday party, yes. I've been here for a week and I can't bring myself to see him. Oh, he's a narcissist. Well, you know, then I, I yeah, I, I don't want to, I'm not judging in any way, but I just say, um, you know, both of my narcissistic parents with their comorbidities had, no, actually, my father didn't last that long. But my mother, I mean, she had a 90th birthday at one point, too, but like, you know, hey, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be there for that. So, um, and you said, I'm trying to tell myself that his sickness isn't my problem. Well, it's not exactly his sickness, but yeah. And, but the family thing is getting to me. Well, you know, that's probably a good indication that this isn't healthy for you. And, you know, a lot of people want to go and do, quote, the right thing, unquote, or, you know, the duty, obligation thing. But sometimes it's just not in people's best interest to do it. So what I would suggest to you, Ed, is even if you've traveled for it or whatever the situation is, if, if you know, it's getting to you, you might want to think about not going through with it. You might want to think about taking care of yourself now and making a choice for you because it just might not, it, it might be too painful or stressful for you. And let's face it, it doesn't matter how old they are. If they didn't get treatment, if they haven't changed it's really hard to, I mean, you're going to be abandoning yourself to go there in the first place anyway. So, you know, that's just, that's just a fact, you know, like that's what people do. If they, if they extend to show up to a family occasion for a narcissist's 90th birthday, if it's getting to you, I would suggest pull out, take care of yourself. Ace, the world has not gone insane tragically. No, it's not insanity. I wouldn't say it's that at all. Um, so I agree. It has simply stopped pretending to be sane. Yes. Oh, wow. I love the way you put things often, Ace. That's really, that's brilliant. Very true. And well put. 
Yeah, I'm starting to wonder about that saying, too, you know, that if we don't pay attention to history, it will repeat itself. Meanwhile, with the massive Mandela effect going on also for many years right now, and, and sort of like leaving this out and rewriting that and switching this and switching that. And they've changed textbooks for education in school. And like, what's going on with all that? So is it that we don't pay attention to history? Or is it that they have a remedy for that? And everything kind of, you know, so yeah. When they stop pretending, they just start reorganizing too. Gaslighting again, you know. Um... And Chevy, you have um, an amazing mind. I'd love to hear it working. Oh, well, thank you for that. I don't know. Um, I, could, I probably owe that to Asperger's, actually, to tell you the truth. Because it has benefits. I don't have too many burdens with it. But the benefit would be the way it chugs along. Although sometimes I get too associative or I forget what I was saying because I go, like, over this way or that way. But thank you for that anyway. I do the best I can. Hey there, Lottie. How are you doing? And Ed, he's definitely untreated and he doesn't have a clue what he does. So he says, he pits my sister and I against each other um, with uh, with half something. Um, he always says something crappy never fails. I've chosen not to be in relationships. Well, you know, I, I would just say sit down, think about it, process it. Why have you made this choice? And do you want to carry through with the choice or not? Is it good for you, right? So, I mean, that that's really the most I can say. Because um, it sounds like from what you're saying that it's not good for you. And But then there's the other side, like, you know, he's older and, you know. But, but like, I know in my life I chose to err on the side of no contact. And then, like, you know, when they die, you work to the, the closure piece through. Which, actually, I haven't found it to be that difficult, actually. I thought, on July 21st, I thought, yes, wow, this is difficult. Lots of emotion. But after that day, it was never the same. Let me just put it that way. And I'm moving through it. So, some days I don't even think about it anymore already. It's only been, like, what? It was two weeks ago when I started the stream. I didn't even notice that. Wednesday, because it's now Thursday here, but I didn't even notice yesterday. All day I was like, I think Monday, I was like, oh yeah, Wednesday will be two weeks since I found out she died like however many weeks ago. I didn't even think of it yesterday once. So that, you know, so what I'm trying to say, Ed, is, you know, you have to make your own choices, but think about the reality that you don't need to abandon yourself right now for duty and obligation or whatever else, um, because... You don't owe them anything. And so you need to take care of yourself. And then I would just suggest not compromising yourself. And then when they pass away, you get that final piece of closure. And if it's anything like my experience, that day I think it was like five, seven, eight hours off and on of crying and feeling pain. And then something else came up and I've kind of worked that through. But like really... Um, just not that overwhelmingly important at the end of, you know, I had I had to go through some feelings, but yeah. Um, and Tom, the person I've been talking about isn't the first person who I connected with that has BPD. How do we find each other? Well, you know, that's a good question because, I mean, it's not an accident, let me put it that way. But nobody consciously knows, right? Like, people with codependency don't, like, I'm looking for this person who'll be like this and do this to me. And people at BPD don't even have any awareness of, like, how they're looking for something that's going to replicate something. that they Because it's trauma bond related. And it's also, it's just, it's just the dynamic reality of the fit that isn't a fit, right? But it comes together in the beginning, it feels like it fits like a glove. But it's... The answer to that question, how do you find each other, it's really, for the borderline, it's the lost self. And it, and I know that's hard to make sense out of something that isn't there, but I have to put it that way. It's the lost self and the longing and yearning to try to find and repair all of that and the, in the unconscious. And for people with codependency in the unconscious, it's the inner child Geiger counter looking for familiarity to one degree or another from one parent or the other. 
And, you know, the other thing I would say about the, uh, something along the same lines is, like, my parents were both alcoholics as well. And everywhere we moved, we moved a lot because of my father's job, businesses, and what he did and all that. But, like, every time we would move, no kidding, they would find two or three other couples. They weren't really, like, they, whenever they socialized, it was, like, just an alcohol fest, really. You know, and, and what I've experienced... Like in my younger years and when I was at university and etc. Like a lot of people, I watched a lot of people that were, because some people were alcoholic then already or getting there. And, um, and some people just drank too much once in a while and some people were fine. But like I watched people that, like when, when I go to parties, it's like, and I didn't drink. I was like, they seem to be more or less socializing with the alcohol, not really each other. So my point anyway is like how do codependents find borderlines and and there and you know I gave you kind of an idea of how that happens but the other thing is my question was always how do alcoholics find alcoholics because they do and like everywhere we lived they'd find like a couple of couples neighbors or something somewhere and they'd all get together and drink until four or five six in the morning you know like uncanny and so really it's something going on in in the unconscious. Maybe not so much when the alcoholics find each other, though, because, well, I don't know if they know they're alcoholics or not, but they like the same kind of drinks, right? But it it's really about the trauma. It's unresolved trauma that leads people to, like, sameness and likeness or the opposite of. And it's really a quest of a wounded inner child on a very unconscious level trying to get help, right, for for the childhood trauma that many people are still carrying with them and so when people with codependency are looking to fix the borderline and why very complicated but a part of that is that it's that screaming inner child in people that needs your attention and until you do that work you know people would really still be if they just went back and dated after that i've had many clients that have like had a relationship with personal ppd they have codependency they break up they don't know anybody at, at the time and then they go to the next relationship and it's now and now then they get with a narcissist and then they go through all that hell and then they break up and then they go date again and then they get in a relationship with another boron and so some people have to really go through it a few times before they're like whoa wait a minute here and that's a lot of trauma so, um, but the answer really is what's in the unconscious and what people are really looking to find that is the remedy to the pain that's down deep, whether a person has codependency, BPD, or NPD. And it's not all the same. It's not going to manifest the same or to the same degree. Um, so I hope that gave you some kind of an answer because um, I don't know that it's the answer, but it's really around the patterns and things that I've definitely seen, you know, correlate um, over 31 years of working with people and my own lived experience. Um, Ed, I've tried to get him into care two times and my sister is blocking and throwing me under the bus. So I wash my hands with this happy BS, with his happy BS, um, but still irritated and feeling kind of lost because I'm supposed to take care of him, supposedly. Well, it sounds like you have a sister there who, for whatever reason, thinks that's her job. Guess what? Let her have it. Because she, you know, who knows? And maybe what happens in a lot of the, these kind of dysfunctional families of origin is, I, I don't know, and you don't have to say anything, but the golden child in my family of origin certainly got a lot more of that estate than I did if you get my drift. So, it, you know, whether there's an estate there or not, right, it could be that somebody wants to to push you out of the way to get favor and toward that end. And otherwise, if not that, who knows what it is. But if they're blocking you and throwing you under a bus and they want control, then you know what? It's, it's difficult to deal with. I went through that in a different way, but I was already no contact, whatever. But it's like... Just, yeah, just back up and let her have it. And then you, because you said you're supposed to take care of him, supposedly. But I guess she has other ideas about that for some reason. And there's no sense, um, you know, getting into a, well, you know, it's difficult stuff emotionally, I understand. But 
Um, you said, my concern is that everything is done fairly. Well, yeah, and if you hang on to that, you're going to you're gonna be abandoning yourself a lot, and you're going to be stressed out, and you're going to get hurt even more. Because fair at the best of times is more a concept than applicable reality to life, more often than not. So you might have to let go of that. You know, it depends on what the dynamics are. You've given me an idea, but again, I can't go any deeper because I don't really know the rest of the story, so to speak, or the moving pieces of the dynamics. And like, where did that phone go? Okay. Um, and you said she has two houses, and I guess that's not enough. I've never had a home of my own. Oh, well, there you go. So, uh, you know... The question would come up, is the sibling a narcissist <laughs> or a cluster B? And, um, yeah, maybe they can never get enough. And maybe you can't control what's fair or not fair. You know what I mean? Like, speaking of somebody who's sitting in it in the middle of it right now, I mean, because I guess I got told the truth about what I got left, but I don't know. I won't know until I see the check, but I don't expect that it would be any more than I was told it was, for sure. could be less. Um, but I've already done the math and approximation. And, yeah, it's like, compared to what others got, it's, it's like ridiculous. But, like, so what? I don't care, because I let go of that a long time ago. And you said his money is not ours. Well, then, so what is the sister worrying about? Or what is the sister hoping to gain? Or what... What's motivating her? And the fact is, so I don't know what you want to be, quote, fair, unquote, but the pursuit of fair, in air quotes, is, is usually a very dichotomous reality, whether people realize it or not. And it's usually something that's healthiest to let go of. Because in these families of origin with a cluster B parent, uh... At least in my lived experience in working with clients, there's no such thing as fair. And you said, my dad is weird about people getting his money. Well, I think, I think, yeah, I think a lot of them have, well, especially narcissists have a lot of ideas about that. And you said, um, who the hell knows, AJ? I don't. Well, yeah, neither did I. And even though I got told supposedly what I got left, I mean, I won't really know for sure until I see the check, which I guess is going to take six weeks or whatever, and it doesn't matter to me anyway. So, but it might be that your sister thinks if she curries favor and, you know, whatever, you know, pushes you out of the way and looks like the all good one, maybe she thinks he'll, he'll you know, Give give all his money to her, which like may well not be the case. So, but yeah, whenever whenever that kind of dynamics going on, and you're supposed to be the one, or I mean, I was the oldest, and you know, in, in a normal family, the executor of the will would be the oldest. But like at the end of the day, is it worth it? Is it worth the stress? Is it worth the conflict? Is it worth? the old, you know, tried, true, tested, and known landscape of the family of origin to be bothered with any of it is what people have to really decide. And Tom, my ex, I suspect, has BPD, says they have CPTSD, although they have a really intense fear of rejection and also ideations. Um, can you talk about how to tell the difference between the two? Well, you keep asking me these questions, and in generalities, I'm not going to be much help because... Generalities. Um, I, yeah, people with BPD, if they're diagnosed with BPD, as it stands right now today, means they really don't have CPTSD. So, there's been other studies I'm aware of, like outside of America, where they keep delineating between CPTSD and BPD, and then NPD, because BPD is not a form of NPD. So, the bottom line is that you know, all three are trauma responses. I think BPD is closer to CPTSD than NPD is, but they're not the same. But a lot of people with BPD are saying today, well, it's CPTSD. And, like, I think they're very close and they overlap, but I don't think they're one in the same. So, 
if you're seeing BPD patterns in this person, then maybe they prefer the label CPTSD for a lot of understandable reasons, but it would be hard to say. And so, um, an intense fear of rejection isn't like a major thing that you could say, oh, therefore they have BPD. Because a lot of codependents have, um, you know, an intense fear of rejection. Or people with dependent personality disorder. Um, ideations aren't just found in people with BPD either. So, um, and some people with CPTSD can, can be very suicidal and or commit suicide. So, none of those things are going to be the real like the delineating um, aspects, really. So the difference between the two, well, they do overlap. I guess the difference is that there isn't the same level of or the same, okay, there's emotional dysregulation, there could be flashback, but there isn't the same kind of, well, Just a second. What happened? Hey, what are you doing? Are you okay? Are you okay, baby? Hey, I get. Oh, no. What the hell? All right, all right. Hey, come here, babe. Come here. You're all right now. You're all right. Jake, go lay down. What have you been up to? Did you get your pasta? Come here. You're okay, baby. You're okay. You're okay, all right? So that was fear. Okay. It's all right now. Settle down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take it easy. Jake, get over there and stay away from there. Sorry about that, guys, but like, wow. Whenever you hear something like that, it's either pain or it's fear or somebody's stuck. And so I don't know what happened there, but she's okay. Jake, leave it and get back, and I, I mean it, seriously. You guys have been doing too much of this. Now the cat's out in the hall freaking out. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, where was I? <laughs> Before all that happened. Um, oh yeah, BPD, CPTSD. Well, they do overlap, so it's more like in CPTSD you don't see the same primal trauma as you do from people with BPD in the sense of splitting and and you know like so idealizing and devalue and that type of thing so about the best i can do with it right now given the fact that i just lost my entire train of thought too understandably so i think she's scared the living crap out of herself there angie angie i'd love to let her out of there but i can't let her out of there without her going to the washroom first and so um is it possible to have both um I would think not. I would think it would be redundant and inaccurate. That's my feeling. But I mean, I think people are thinking or saying or reporting to people that they're getting diagnosed with both. Angie, what are you doing now? Lay down, okay? Relax. No, I don't I don't think they're like comorbid or co-occurring. You know, it did we really they're both trauma responses, both have childhood onset, but there are differences, and I think BPD really needs to be moved into a category, something like CPTSD, but not exactly. But no, I, I mean, I don't believe, but, but you know, you might hear somebody else would say, yeah, they're definitely, they can coexist, but I don't think so. And psychiatry doesn't recognize CPTSD, which might really, I mean, in America, which might really inform us about the fact that perhaps there is a way to put BPD into this category with maybe one delineating major difference. And, and, and that's, it's interesting because in Pete Walker's book, he talked all around that. He said if the APA would put complex post-traumatic stress disorder in the DSM, that they'd end up having a pamphlet instead of a growing compendium of like nonsense and pseudoscience to medicate people for. Um, but then there was a specific thing he said, I haven't looked at the book for quite a while now, but in the first chapter, specific thing he mentions borderline personality aside from that because that is the quote, mental health, systemic, politically correct, in air quotes, thing to do. So I don't think people would end up having both. 
And Tom said, sorry if I'm being a pain. I'm just so curious. Thank you. No, you're not being a pain. It's just some, some questions really are difficult to answer, not only when your dog starts yelping and you don't know what's going on, but um, in generalities, right, as opposed to, like, if I was working with somebody as a client and got asked certain questions with with more, um, you know, more basis and more information and context. That's what I was looking for. And Ed said, no, it's not worth the BS. My sister, it seems, never has enough. She raised her children to be selfish jerks, so I guess she's made her bed. I don't know. Well, sounds like she could be a narcissist. I don't know either. Um, and, uh, well, everybody has to rant once in a while, I think. Um, Amy, um, I hope you're... Oh, yeah, my dog's okay. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there was no injury, but I think it was a matter of... I don't know what was... Jake was doing up... He was up close to her, and she's in a crate. And then, and then I don't know, like, I just think she got her paw stuck or something. I didn't see it, because by the time I got the light turned and everything, she didn't appear to be stuck. But then, you know, this is the other thing. Like, Jake and Angie both are, Jake is really more, what do you call it, neurotic. Angie's getting closer on that scale. Like, I was really hoping to get a mellow, like my late dog, Lucy, but unfortunately, Angie's like sometimes somewhat mellow, but at the first sign is something very, very histrionic to neurotic, and that's what we just heard. So it scared her. She probably had her, her paw stuck in the crate, like in the cage for a minute. That's probably what happened. So, um, and, and she's probably okay. Like, we'll see. I'll get her out soon. And if she's limping a little or something, but I doubt she, she settled down now. So, and you know, I'll just say this happened at, I was in the kitchen when Jake was, I just got Jake. He was a puppy. He was six weeks old. You're not supposed to take him by before eight weeks, but he was in an awful situation. So I did anyways. And yes, he's neurotic and he's got separation anxiety, but he's a sweetheart. Uh, but sometimes when I just leave the room he's in, like he'll whine for me or howl a little bit. It's like, Oh, come on, man. Usually when he's with the other dogs, he's fine. But, um, so, yeah, I remember I was in the kitchen back and it was about 2011, 12 or whenever I got Jake. And he was six weeks old and I had him in this crate, which was huge for him. And I thought, uh, should be no problem. And then I'm in the kitchen and I heard the same kind of noise, only worse, as we just heard Angie do. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's happening? And I go running in there and Jake had his um, jaw stuck in, in the crate. And I was like freaking out and I didn't even think to just pull the bars because you can, you know, but like I got him out of there and like, you know, so I think that's just what happened to her now too. So, um, and Amy said, yeah. And you said, I think my last question got drowned in a bunch of new questions. The question is the one, how far, sorry, is the one of how far the no contact should go and whether it's healthy to keep bumping into her. Um, no, the no contact should, um, uh, you shouldn't bump into her. Now, if you bump into her, okay, so bumping into somebody, I'm thinking one thing. And crossing paths is a different thing. Because if you still have to cross paths and you can't help it, then you, you cross the street or you wait for them to go by or you leave, you go a different way if you can. If you have to actually walk right by them, you walk right by them, you don't look at them, you look through them, you don't talk to them. So no contact is really the best way to go. No exceptions, no chit chats for like meeting in a parking lot or being at the same place on a sidewalk at the same time or something. So um, that that's what would be healthiest for you, really. And you said, I can copy and paste it again if you can't find it. Also, thank you for all your help. Oh, I thought that was it. So that's what I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I don't know that I ever saw it. Like, I mean, yeah, if, if, if I didn't answer it, you know, um, I'm only going to be here a couple more minutes. But if you want to copy and paste it, if that wasn't enough of an answer, um, because, yeah, really, it should be no contact is maintained even when you're walking right past them. So, and, and a lot of people, you know, with codependency will find that really hard to do. And you might feel all guilty and all kinds of stuff. But just know that's coming from somewhere else. And this would be upholding a healthy boundary called, it's no contact. And so whether I see them or not, 
I'm I'm not acknowledging them. Um, and you said, I'll write it again. We go to the same college. I was thinking of doing online classes to avoid seeing her on a daily basis. It's too traumatizing for me to keep seeing her. Well, you know, if you can do online classes, that might be a really wise choice for now until you have some more time, right? Um, and... Yeah, you know, you need you, you might need more time, right? Because I don't know if you've gotten into therapy yet or not, but you need to work out healing from this more and the codependency. And then probably you'll find that you're a lot better off with those, with the kind of boundaries needed to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's just a fresh, fresh situation as well. So you might need space and time, you know. And then, like, say, if there was another year of school after that, if you took, if you could go to online classes for now, then you might find that that would be more doable, like in time, you know, to to be in the same um, place and whatnot. So, but if it's too tra traumatizing to keep seeing her, then you need space away if you can get it, like doing the online classes, because you need to, yeah, you need to process, you need to heal, and when people keep seeing people, it just keeps on triggering stuff, right? So, um, I hope that was helpful. And, um, yeah, so I thought this was going to be shorter, like an hour and a half ago, but it went, I, it went longer. So I should probably get going, though. Um, just waiting to see if there's anything else from Amy there. I'm not sure. And, um, yeah, so just know that when you've been abused by somebody, the, you know, like with VP, there's no love there. People with codependency have to heal and recover. You know, family of origin and from codependency to have healthier love as well and find your own self partnering your way toward independent relating. And so, you know, these, these relationship breakups are so complicated, but relationship breakups are actually healthier when they're black and white. In other words, when it's over, it's over. And we don't try to be friends, and we don't try it over again. And it's not the borderline goes to their therapy, and the codependent goes to their therapy, and we'll stay in touch, and then we'll try to be friends later, or will, which is often a want to try the relationship again. So people have to be aware of how you're feeling isn't going to help you out. You have to use your head, and you have to, with intent, you know, do what you need to do because it's so hard to do without a doubt. And 0990, uh, this um, really is a long journey, huh? Well, um, if by this you mean codependency recovery, I'd say to, for people to really, um, if you really get into the work and, um, you know, it, it, it can be like two years or so or a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, depends and then maybe people aren't really ready to date exactly or go forward in a relationship yet um it's it's not the same for everybody and for people with bpd it's going to be years yeah it's, it's really longer time so um well that's interesting jennifer i don't know really um that's her problem right makes no sense um, Ed, so it really is all right if I don't go to my dad's party. Yeah, it's absolutely all right. Partner with yourself, take care of yourself, give yourself permission. And you said, I'll go for my mom and my son, and that works. Thank you. Well, there you go. So sacrifice yourself for other people and just realize your choice, no judgment here, but that's codependent. So you're not looking after number one. And because I think that you could see your mother... And you you know, and of course you see your son, but you could do something separate with your mother, but, and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say more because all I know is if I ever had a kid, they never would have known my parents. So, you know, but, but people's situations are whatever they are. Not everybody makes the same choices. So, um, but it's interesting how you put that all together there. So it's really all right if I don't go to my dad's party and then. You said, I'll go for my, oh, I guess you mean it's okay for you, but you're going to go for your mother and your son, and that works. Well, it's still self-abandonment, but okay, as long as you're aware of that, right? I mean, it's up to you. It's your, your choice, your life, your decision. So, um, but 
yeah, I would just say if it were me and I had a son, he wouldn't even go in there. And, well, if you're close to your mom, I would have probably made separate arrangements. But everybody does their own thing. And you just stay cool, okay? Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I guess that's it for me. And, um, yeah, circular reasoning and circular choices run amok in codependency in a variety of ways. And that's not judgment. That's just like a summary of why people really have to deal with this. Well, I don't know, Ed. I mean, uh, you just, you're just you going to make whatever choice you're going to make, but I think that you need to... Uh, you should be thinking about number one. That's you. Because... Like you said, you've seen your mom several times and you live with your son, so I don't know. It's up to you. Um, I just know that people need to take care of themselves, most best I can say. So anyway, I got to go attend and make sure my dog's okay. Everybody take care. I got to get going. And this computer is friggin' hot right now. So, until next time, who knows when that will be?